uh, we've been using them to push that 8550 to its limits. Welcome, everyone, back to another Sunday live stream. I hope you all had a wonderful week. We did as well. Got to see the grandson twice, so that always is a great thing. Uh, I think he's got a Christmas program next Tuesday, so we'll get to see him then. Then, and then we got a big luncheon to go to Wednesday. And I just want to tell you guys that this coming Sunday, the see what that is. Check my calendar here. So the 18th, we're going to start the show at two o'clock, not one o'clock. I have a lunch date with my buddy. Uh, he's a disabled 77 year old gentleman who has some problems with his hands and motor skills. And I bought him a model airplane for Christmas. We're going to put it together during a luncheon that we're going to attend. And so I'll be home a little bit later. I just didn't want to cut it short. I want to spend some time with him. And really, uh, he is crazy about airplanes. He makes me drawings all the time. He's a little bit uh, behind uh, in his uh, cognitive uh, skills, let's just say. But he loves airplanes, and so the best thing I could do for him, I made him an album with some 5 by 7s of all kinds of era, uh, World War I, World War II, different countries, all of these aircraft, and I made him an album with that and some Pecos River Gloss 5 by 7 For some reason, it can handle that. It just cannot handle the dual-coated one for I think it's because of the opposite side is also glossy and very slippery. So, and then Christmas Sunday, no live stream. We will be with the family all day long. And so I will have to postpone that one. And had it been another day, then yes, but uh, no, it's Christmas Day. It's on Sunday. So I will not be doing the live stream. What I will do is I will make a video. It'll be at least a half an hour video explaining all kinds of different things, and I'll schedule it for Sunday. Um, so it won't be something interactive. It'll just be something for you guys to watch. And then we'll be back as normal after the, what, when is the next Sunday? Oh, New Year's, New Year's Day. Uh, I don't think we have anything planned for that day, family-wise. Uh, if if it happens that we do, um, I'll have to make an adjustment, but I don't think at this point we have anything going on for that. The 1st of January, that's also on a Sunday. Really weird. That, that hardly ever happens. Let me go to our chat. Let's see. Let's start from the top. So we have 33 on board. Uh, we have Richard Bender. And uh, you can see what he has. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna read everything anymore. Uh, it just takes too long. Uh, but Richard Bender, Richard Bender is set up pretty nicely here, and he's a drone flyer, so excellent. Nigel Waters, be careful with the new laws that are coming out, <laughs> my friend. Uh, especially the uh, so-called uh, ID, remote ID. That's not implemented yet, but it will be in the next few years, and it may affect um, your situation with that drone. You'll have to update it. Uh, Nigel Waters from Wales, UK. He's got a Pro 300 with all the trimmings. Sounds like Christmas. CYH, waiting with a beta breath for, from Charlotte, North Carolina. Epson P900. I hope we can, you know, come through and uh, give you what you expect today. I do not have a guest, so it'll be just little old me once again. Um, there was a lady that was with us last week. She never really contacted me, um, so I don't know whether she wanted to discuss uh, her website and, and so forth. Remember, we had a, a website from her. Let me take a drink. I'm going to tell you what this is in a minute. Let me quick finish here. If you have any questions, don't wait until later to post them. Post them now on the chat. Martin is here from Netherlands. Use your old stuff. I love that. Scooby Club. He says, I'm a poor person. I only have a Pixma. Well, there are so many Pixmas out there. I can't keep up. 
Which one do you have? Mark Flanagan. Uh, hello, everyone from Ireland. Of course, you are Flanagan. Yes. Um, with my new Epson Eco Tank 8550 that I haven't put the ink in yet. Cannot wait until the holidays to get it running. Now, I should have done that this week. And we're going to attempt to print some stuff today as well. I think I'll be okay. I may have to, I may have to stop and add some ink. My Pro 1000. Speaking of adding ink, um, I have two white lights. One of them was flashing on and off. That means that those positions are in need of topping off. That means they're down to twenty percent from empty. So I'll be doing that after after the uh, live stream. I got to do Chrome Optimizer and Photo Blue. So, no, Photo Cyan, sorry, not blue. And I'm thinking whether I should just top everything off and just start from fresh again. A lot of people have that 8550. Ryan Will Devins. Will Devins. I am from Yosemite, California. That's gorgeous out there. And my Epson Eco Tank 8550 just arrived on Friday and have printed a few images. I'm so excited to learn more. It is quite a printer. I, I am so impressed with it. I never expected it to be uh, as good a performer as it has been. It has a few little weaknesses. Uh, feeding mechanism cannot handle every kind of media out there. I looked in the driver everywhere, unless, unless I'm blind, which could be. Um, I did not see any option for me to increase the gap distance. Okay, I'll show you why that's important with some papers, even the thinner ones. Emmanuel from Normandy, France. He's got a uh, 300 ink out Rudy holder. Everything you everything you need really to successfully print. Mike Brantley or Brentley. Uh, Jose, been watching your videos and recorded streams for months, but finally catching one live from Mobile, Alabama, rocking an 11-year-old Pixma 9500 Mark II. Wow. Congratulations. I'm glad that thing's still working. Mine decided to die, so I removed the print head, and I use it as a as a prop here. I don't even know if that print head's still any good. It should be. I flushed it really well. Before I continue, let me show you one real little trick that you can do. Um, if you're very careful, say you have done nozzle checks and you have some problems here and there and you do a, a cleaning cycle and it sort of begins to improve. But then it's sort of every time you do it, it's like a slightly different and you know result. And you want to go ahead and clean this. So I would passively add your cleaning solution while it rests over a tray with some paper towels that have been wetted with the cleaning solution. It could be Windex, it could be LA Awesome, it could be just about anything. Uh, simple Green works as well. But I have heard, and I have yet to try it because I do have one. I actually have two of them. Um, one that I actually use on my teeth. You know what I'm talking about, water pick. So water pick, but loaded with cleaner. And then very at the lowest setting, apply it directly to the nozzles and to the ports and to the nozzles and to the port. You don't want to shoot that full strength. And some people, you know, talk about putting them in, you know, submerging them in an ultrasonic cleaner. No, don't do that. Ultrasonic cleaners actually are very, very strong uh, and can cause electronic problems internally. They can actually cause problems. Uh, even though it sounds like a good idea, but it really is not. All right. So the water pick uh, seems to work really well, and it has solved some problems for some people. But again, you got to be careful. It's like your last resort where removing the printhead and passively cleaning it did not do the job. You then move up a couple of notches to the water pick. And then, of course, afterwards, use the still water over and over and over very gently until all of the cleaning solution has been removed from the internal components. And then you let it dry, put it, put it back in the printer, and then hope for the best. I have yet to revive my Pro 100. I just haven't had the time. HM from, Phil from Central Philadelphia, Epson XP 15,000. 
uh, Epson Inks, uh, Red, Red River Papers, Cumish Ultimate, Corel Paint Job. Happy holidays to you too, my friend. Niels from Denmark, Epson 8550, awesome, and Canon Pro 1000. Wow. Those are going to be competing with each other. I'm telling you, man, it's, it's, it's crazy how close that printer that printer produces uh, results that nearly match the Pro 1000. And when you consider the cost of inks to run this baby and the cost of inks to run that other baby, uh, then you, you can, you know, maybe decide which way to go. Uh, Pro 1000, of course, is top of the line, awesome printer. It's just always maintaining itself, and that costs you ink. You just got to come up with a strategy, a printing strategy, so that you actually print more than the printer cleans itself. And, of course, that means you're using ink. You see, there's no way to avoid that. So you either waste your ink cleaning or you use your ink to print. And so, yeah. That, of course, you know, that that's a sermon that I don't want to get into at this point. Emmanuel says, I get a four-color eco-tank for home printing. It's also print photos very well with profiling. Yeah. Even the, um, well, think, let me, let me add to that. So when you say four-color, you're talking about yellow, magenta, cyan, and black. That's it. No gray. But think about this. This one is literally, if you, if you want to call colors... Something with color like yellow, like magenta, like orange, or blue, blue, and all the other colors, not gray. You're printing with yellow, magenta, cyan, and black, and a gray. Black and gray are not really what you would call colors, okay? So you're able to produce ridiculously good results with what technically is a five-color printer. I never would have believed you had you told me that. But... I got to accept what I'm getting as proof. I cannot deny that. I cannot be a denier. Yes. Michael Cavaliere, Epson P800, and a new baby Epson 8550. Prints very well and very happy with it. I got to get my P800 going and uh, then make some prints with it. I've been ignoring it for far too long. My Pro 1 has been printing regularly with the uh, QImage Unclog tool, my Pro 1000, every day at 10 at night with the Q same thing. And uh, so far, so good. I'm actually printing. I'm not cleaning. But, you know, if I decide tonight to print something, it's going to print it straight away without running a pre-print cleaning cycle. Fred says, uh, my second topic is to ask you if anyone has made a panel print. So far, I have not. Again, what I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm going to experiment very, very small first. I just want to make sure that the accuracy of the matching uh, is there, which it should be. Uh, they have proven that. Uh, I'm going to just simply use it with letter size paper and make a larger print uh, with it. Um, I, I just recently saw a triple panel canvas. One Left and right panels were actually shorter, vertically speaking, and then the central one was taller. And it had about an inch gap between them, and the whole thing flowed. It actually, image-wise, it flowed because the image, that one inch of image that was missing was taken into account when they created those panels on canvas, including, including the border that is basically mirrored, and then you fold on your canvas frames your stretcher bars really neat so yours came out great as well awesome it was easier than it looks yeah it's easy uh, you just got to trim it accurately if you got a good trimmer uh, you can go ahead and uh, trim it I have not seen Mike's video yet I have to oh I'm so embarrassed yeah I have not seen it yet I need to make time and watch that a couple of times and see whether there is any difference with uh, QMH Ultimate compared to one, which was demonstrated for us a couple of weeks ago. For Haven says, uh, Hi, Jose, Pro 1000 new owner. We got 45 people on board right now. Cat food. Love you, Jose. Gracias for all your videos. Por nada. Es mi placer, señor. 
Okay, my pleasure, sir. Ralph Urban from Rattingen, Germany. Uh, P600 Kimmich for Mac. All right. My wife's maiden name is Schreiber. She is from like Western Germany uh, and also um, uh, England. So her mom is basically pure British um, and her father is German. Okay. From Cornwall. Yeah, that's where they're from, Cornwall. Beautiful. Okay, per S. Stromheim. Stromheim. Um, hi, Perez from Norway. Perez, that's my, if you add a Z to that, that would be my uncle's last name uh, from Spain. Uh, he's from Norway, 8550 Kirmish Ultimate. Thank to you. Thanks for your videos. Appreciate that. Thank you for being here. Mike Brantley. I was a bad boy, Leroy Brown, and led my 9500 Mark II sit for five years with old ink, research getting a new 300, but then I got the old printer going again for now. Wow. That is a success story. See, it, it's not that it's not that difficult. It can it can be fixed. It's just when um when a Canon print hit has reached that point where it can no longer go. Even though you can clean it so that it physically flows, you can actually shoot liquid through it. It doesn't mean that it is electronically viable, viable anymore. Uh, so you have to take that into account. They do eventually die. They do eventually wear out, and they are meant to be replaced. But you got you got lucky there. Very good. Good story. Bill Weeks, I uh, have an Epson... Workforce 7010, printhead clock. I've done everything to get it unclogged, no luck so far. Is that a pigment printer or a dye ink? And uh, are the cartridges, they float on the printhead or do they sit stationary? Um, cleaning cycles and soaking the underside of the printhead over, you know, paper towels with Windex or some other uh, cleaner, something that is really active. Uh, there are some professional head cleaners out there that you can purchase from some of these companies. I don't know what the the blend or what their formulation is, but they they do work eventually. It takes a long time sometimes to like my man here with a five year old. Uh, worse yet, a Canon printer, a an Epson print head can take a relative you know a lot of abuse. Let's just say when you are cleaning. Um, but not a cannon. So, you know, you have, you have some possibilities of getting it clean. It's just a matter of waiting. You do a cleaning cycle. You do a nozzle check. You look at the results and then soak the printhead. In other words, get a, get a paper towel, fold it into like a triple thick strip, about an inch wide, lay it on the plate and, uh, to disconnect the printhead from the parking station, Turn off the printer completely. Turn it on. As soon as it detaches and begins to move, this is before you put down the soaked paper towel. Pull the plug, and that way the printhead assembly now is uh, basically disconnected from the parking station. Lay down your strip. Get it nice and wet. Not Don't drown it, but get it nice and wet with a Windex with ammonia and slide the printhead over it, and hopefully... You will not get a snag of paper, a wet paper towel or something like that. And then just let it sit there for a couple of hours. Slide it over to the right. Look at the paper towel. You should have ink galore on it. And then move it over to the right again. Connect back again. Start another cleaning cycle. Another nozzle check. And repeat this as many times as you have to. But not immediately one after the other. Let it sit overnight. In fact... I would dribble with a pipette or something long, a syringe with a long needle, some cleaner on the parking station, let it park itself over there, pull the plug once it is parked and quiet, pull the plug, let it sit there overnight, connect it again the next day and continue doing this. Either it will work eventually or just not, okay? 
And if it is a total, you know, if that ink has turned to epoxy, let's just say, then it's not going to be cleaned. And you'll have to get a new print printer. Getting a new print, hair, print head on this printer is really not a good financial decision. It will cost you more than the printer. Brad Gerson, 8550, just delivered this week. Ooh, still in a box. Awesome. That is something that would be nice to have as a spare, let me tell you. Okay, let me let me do this guy. Uh, Michael Jung, Jung uh, Brooklyn, New York here, still deciding on a printer upgrade, having issues trying to print neutral, black and white, or an ST2000. Now, that is... What is that? Is that an Epson, like a plotter? What kind of printer is that? Just go ahead and answer on the chat uh, if you get a chance. I would like to know what printer that is. Okay, so what I am drinking here is a drink made out of tamarindo, which is tamarind. It's the ugliest bean pod looking fruit grows on tropical trees. Uh, if you're from Southeast Asia, if you're from the Caribbean, you know what this is. And they make syrup for this. And in Puerto Rico, we have uh, ice cones. I don't know whether they even do that anymore. That's when I was a child. They literally scrape ice with like, it looks like a wood planer. They collect the shaved ice, as shaved ice, and then put it on a cone, mold it, and put that tamarind syrup, tamarindo syrup. And this is called jarritos or little jars okay so or let's see see the little pictures back there yeah and it is mm, an acquired taste let's just say but i love it it really helps your your throat oh okay look per S. Stromheim, Stromsheim, Stromsheim, I think. Uh, I think he just posted something earlier. So far, the 8550 has expected my expectation, has exceeded my expectations. New owners, so testing different papers these days to become familiar with the printer. Does it work on canvas? Yes, it certainly does. It surely does. I have, I have done videos and demos here live uh, showing you that. I got some back there somewhere. I just don't want to get up right now and spend time looking for it. But yeah, it does work. Often you may have to maybe make sure that it is positioned correctly on the upper the upper uh, feed tray so that it does not get snagged or not grabbed initially. But once it is grabbed and it advances inside the um, paper travel, it prints beautifully. I have done borderless 11 by, I think it was 11 by 17 canvas from eBay that I got. It had a name, but it's not really a top quality canvas, but it really worked very, very nicely. Sorry, wait a minute. Henry Stoffel from Chile, Medford, Massachusetts in Epson PA 100. QMH Ultimate OEM Inks. Awesome. It is not so bad today. It's like 42 and cloudy. Um... It was raining last night, I believe. My car was all wet. But the other days, my car was completely frozen with frost. Miss Wendy is here from Belgium, Pro 1000, that decided to turn itself off by itself. I didn't want to fire back on. So, wait a minute. It didn't want to fire back on. Oh, oh. That's not good. Let's see. But after unplugging it for a few minutes, okay. Good. I don't want to hear it. See, my Pro 1000 is always doing weird things onto me, uh, especially if I don't print. So that's why I am printing on it every single day a half sheet of the unclog tool. That's it. 10 o'clock at night, every single night. And uh, that way, nothing, nothing happens that is the result of, say, a week of not printing or, you know, like I said, right now, I have two sensor lights that are on. I have to go ahead and top those off. But that has nothing to do with the printer. That's just It's just measuring via a sensor uh, the levels of ink inside the cartridges. So nothing really mechanical or you know electronically going on with it. As long as I print, 
a so-called purge sheet or unclog sheet every day. Some people might say that's a little bit excessive, but you know what? It works. It's working. Fred says, I need gray ink on my 8660. What is 8660? Fill that one and or fill 10, all topping them off. What is an 8660? Um, is it an EcoTank type printer? And you have 10? What kind of printer is that? Um, or is that... Please explain what that is. Um, what I'm thinking about in my situation, I got 12. What I'm thinking of doing is maybe just doing all of them um, instead of just one or two. Because like I always say with something like the Pro 100, the Pro 10, if you just exchange one, you develop a seesaw, a, a snowball type effect where everything or no domino effect where everything is going to be at weird different levels see if i don't top everything off here at once i'm also going to develop that effect where i'm going to always have inks at different levels so i'm going to just top everything off the heck with it that way you start with a full set of tanks or cartridges whatever that is Stop, tell me what that is man the 8660 Tommy says, a great content, Jose. Are there any low-cost printers that you could recommend for both documents and word prints? Well, it depends. Uh, Epson or Canon, what do you prefer? Um, you know, the all-in-one printers, they, the, the catch with those and some of the ones you find at stores, um, I don't know where you are at, um, but if you go to big lot stores like a Walmart, like, a you know, an electronically based store like like Micro Center, they will often have a very low end all in one printer. That when you buy ink, it costs you more than the printer. So you got to be careful. Do, do your research and see see what it is that you need. In other words, if you're just only going to print documents, um, one of the smaller Eco Tank printers are not cheap initially, but running them is just pennies. Okay, just cents a day. And so you'll be able to get a lot of uh, production out of them without spending a fortune. You just make an initial investment. Finally worked again. Great. That's great news. Always love to hear a success. 62 people watching. Wow. Really? I'm, I'm shocked. Thank you. Thank you guys for coming on board. Rudy Hallam from L.A., he's the, the man that makes these, these beautiful holders right here for all my Pro 10. And look what, look what I found out you can do. I lay my pencil right on there. Isn't that something? So he makes and sells for you guys those holders for the Pro 100, for the Pro 10, for the Pro 300. For the Pro 200, and he also makes uh, filling type equipment for you guys to fill your cartridges without having to modify them. If that's your choice, you want to try that, then he's the man to contact. If you don't want to do that, if you just want to continue, uh, and this is specifically to CLI type cartridges, then get your cartridges from Rick Johnson. Uh, he's probably in the in the uh, background watching, and he provides you with the processed. By that I mean modify for a, with a hole for you to refill a properly drilled hole that is in a plug and also a clip. Let me see if I got one here. Here we go. Like that. This particular clip is the very best. Here's the hole. Here's the refill plug. All you got to do is reset and top off. Never, ever, ever, ever. I repeat this every Sunday just about. Let this go down to empty. Catch it before that. If you're fortunate enough, if you want to make the investment initially, make sure you get two sets of cartridges. That way, one of them is always full and reset. And then whatever cartridge starts to get low, remove all of them. Put them in Rudy's holder while you're ready to refill them later. And then install the complete set. Everything is back up to top. You run one single perch cycle. 
not eight of them every time you change one cartridge, you see. This will not do that. I can just top one off and, and not worry about it, okay? But I'm going to top them all off. With the stationary cartridge or tank systems, normally you do not have purge cycles just because you exchange one of these on the Pro 1000. No, it, it will not do that. There's plenty of ink still internally, so it does not have to do that because air never enter the printhead. With these types of cartridges, or printheads, I should say, you remove one cartridge, well, guess where that printhead had to position itself for you to do that? Over the platen with about a quarter-inch gap of air underneath it, and then you go ahead and remove one cartridge. You now have that empty straw-type situation where air now from the top and from the bottom, the ink just leaves, and it could actually land on your platen. If you don't do it fast enough, you're going to get ink on your platen. So you replace them all at once. It will run one reprime, if you want to call it that. That's it. And now you're full, completely full. You got a couple of months, maybe longer, before you need to uh, do that exchange again. And then you go back to your little holder with your semi-empty, almost low, and other levels. Reset all of them in with your, you know, leisure. At your leisure, I should say, top them all off to full and then put them away until you need them again. Always exchange a complete set. What are the advantages of that? You, be, you may ask, oh, that's, this is ridiculous. Why should I do that? Nobody does. Well, we invented that, okay? Me and Mike. So what you're doing is you're delaying the saturation of those internal pads on the Pro 10 and the Pro 100 and 200 and 300. The longer you can delay that, the longer your printer will not have to be replaced because forget about it. If you think you're going to have a, a shop replace those pads for you and reset it, they got to remove the complete printer out of that carcass. And underneath, at the very bottom, once you remove all the parts, lies those pads. It costs a lot of money. It's really not worth doing it. So just delay that condition as long as possible by instead of having eight purge cycles, they use up ink no matter what on all eight or ten cartridges. Okay? Whether you change one, two, or ten of them. If you change ten of them, that's it. You backed up to full. It's going to take a very long time for you to get one cartridge to the point where you got to change the whole set. If you change one, there's always going to be one about to go low, and it's constantly doing this. You're constantly changing single cartridges. We found that out, okay? And people were having printers prematurely go saturated, the pads. Back in those days, yeah, they did the, the repair, let's just call it, for like 200 bucks, And that's in the days where these Pro 100s were being given away practically and being sold for $100. So you might as well just buy two more printers for $200 repair job. You see what I mean? So there was a reason for that. We invented that method after experimentation. And it works. It works, and that's what we recommend. Bill Weeks, thank you. I'll try again. I'll try it again. Uh, try what again? Let me see. You got to remember, I got the uh, memory of a goldfish, Bill Weeks. Let me go back. Okay. Yeah. Okay. You had the clog uh, 7010, work for 7010 printhead. Yeah. Just keep at it. Keep at it with patience, man. That's all it takes. Or oh, the eco tank. And you got 10? You said all, you said top off all 10? What kind of eco tank is that? Let me see. Let me find you again here. Oh, I'm sorry. You're the wrong guy. I'm sorry. My bad. Uh, yeah. Uh, let's see. Michael Jung had the ST. So ST2000 is like an eco tank printer. And how many colors? I know that they have different names and different nomenclatures overseas. So you must be 
You must not be here in the U.S., are you? Oh, no, you're here in Brooklyn, New York, still deciding on a new printer upgrade, having issues. So you want to maybe get an EcoTank? Sure. Um, if that is what you're asking, I highly recommend them. Yeah. Highly recommend them, especially the 8550. They have, a, um, I think the 8500 is a letter size equivalent to that one also. Same number of tanks, six of them. Busy today from Winnipeg, Manitoba, Canada is here. Canon Pro 100 with all the usuals. All righty. Dr. D, no, DJ Chit Chat. I've learned so much from you. And I used to have a, a Friday video that I was, that I called it Friday Night Chit Chat. This is before I started the live streams. Um, and that was pretty successful. Everybody tuned in for that. I just want to thank you for being such an inspiration and a source of knowledge for all of us as the print community, whether it is DTF sublimation or standard ink. Well, DTF, you guys can uh, teach me about that. I believe that I sort of know what it is, but I am no expert on it. But that's another facet that I would like to uh, also learn to do. So from what I know, it is not sublimation. You just print to a special film and then you transfer using heat, I believe. Yes. I think that's the way it is. Um, does that work better than sublimation? I know you got to dedicate a printer for sublimation. And do you use specific inks for direct-to-transfer? In other words, a direct-to-film? Uh, are those different inks that you use for transferring? Or do you use regular photo inks? been printing um, black and white on 8550 prints very well in black and white. Super fast. Yeah, use black and white mode. Use black and white mode. And if you get a like a slight color cast, you can adjust the opposite direction. You have a color wheel. You're in the middle. And you still get a greenish cast. Go toward magenta. It's the opposite of green. And, and then print another print. Produce another print. And see if you have neutralized that. It prints pretty neutrally neat, linear. If you're if you're spot on, you get a very good linear result. Let me show you real quick here. I didn't plan to do this right now, but you you asked, so you're gonna get. You 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 asked, so you will receive. Eighty five fifty, and I totally forgot which side was which. Dual coated paper. One of them is using an. ICC profile, so working in RGB mode, you can say. So let the application handle color, use the ICC profile for this paper, and then I flip that over and I use black and white mode with the, the density setting to dark instead of darker. Darker is the, re, the default setting, which I don't agree with. So I set it one notch lighter, which is dark, and then the other one is, I forget what it is, lighter or whatever, or light, and then uh, neutral. I don't know which one this is. One of them is with an ICC profile, and one of them is with black and white mode. 8550, folks. So if you don't tell me you cannot get a neutral result on 8550. And this is, this is, uh, I believe, Red River uh, Polar Luster. So it is both sides coded. I'm getting reflections. If you see color, that's from the screen, folks. So let me back up. One is black and white mode. And one of them is ICC profile. So as you can see, it's possible. And again, if you got a slight color cast, you might actually like it if it's kind of a, like a brownish sepia look, a warm look. It depends on the type of image that you're producing. That ocean view, maybe maybe I want it to be a little bit bluer. So I would add, I would move that little pointer, literally grab it with my mouse and slide it over slightly. It's not a slider, it's a, it's a, it's a, a circle. So you have all your colors, your, your primary, secondary, primary, secondary, and so forth. And you just, if you have uh, neutral and you want to go slightly browner, so you just look for that particular area in the color wheel and slide that little central uh, cursor. 
and then reprint and see what you get. If you like what you get, you can save that as a setting. And then you're good to go after that. Bill Weeks, the ink is dye ink. Cartridges travel with the, uh, okay. Ink, so it should not be that difficult. Dye inks uh, are not going to be a problem because they never really totally solidify. Like pigment inks have particles. Think about it. If you get down to the microscopic level, you're, you're shooting gravel suspended in a liquid through a tiny little nozzle. Yeah. So yeah, dye ink will 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 um, respond to cleaners that can dissolve dried ink, and you know Windex does that. And again, if you if you want to try some of the proprietary cleaners that some of these companies are selling, by that I mean uh, third party ink companies, they do sell. Uh, um, there's PSO Flush from Inkjet Mall, that is expensive but is quite effective. Um, Windex is the cheapest thing I have come across. You can use LA Awesome. You can use, I believe, Simple Green. Just dilute it, maybe two, three fold, and then use that uh, to clean your, or attempt to dissolve anything that may be due to dry ink. Um, it's not going to fix a mechanical or a, an electronic problem, so be aware of that. Are you getting totally blank results? Nothing on the nozzle check? That could be something else. If you're getting a nozzle check that is just, you know, missing a few steps here or there, then yeah, then your print head is working. It's just clogged, you know. G2393 from Belgium. What part of Belgium? I was with the uh, Supreme Headquarters, Allied Powers Europe. Uh, near Mons, is Mons was about southwest of it, um, just down the road on the canal, basically. Um, that was the big headquarters for the um, NATO. Okay, eighty-five fifty. So that's that's what you meant. But again, um, let me go back to Fred here. Did you really mean to say 10 here? Fill them. I think you meant to say fill them. Yeah, top them all off. Absolutely. Yeah, top them all off. That way you start from fresh. Just put the bottles in and let it do its thing. It'll, it'll reach a certain level and stop. Remove the bottles and then just save the extra ink for... The next time you top off and make sure you buy yourself a new set of inks be aware that the set of the five dye inks do not include the black pigment ink okay you got to buy that separately i am not going to be refilling my dye inks with some other source but i will be refilling my pigment black ink with precision colors i already did that this is the high def or the high dynamic range black ink that was meant for the uh, P800. It's a lot um, denser and produces deeper blacks than a, say, a common ink that would have been used on an Epson um, uh, K3 Ultra Chrome, maybe like a 3800 R2000, I mean R3000. That would have used the non-high density ink or HD ink. Let's see. Checked in late due to sign-in issues from Florida. Epson P900. Screen name formerly Jack and Coke. Oh, okay. Wow. Um, where are you in Florida? Because you got the same name my brother-in-law has. <laughs> Okay, and he's down in Florida. Hmm. DJ Chit Chat says, you are responsible for my drive behind the OEM method of using X, XP15000 for DTF. I started a community on Facebook that never would have happened if it hadn't, wasn't for the knowledge and experiences you show. I would love to join your um, community. Your Is that a group? 
a Facebook group? Yeah. Can you post down the uh, put down the name of your group and I can look it up and then apply? 66 watching Tommy I'm not going to say that he says thank you can I pronounce I can't pronounce these names uh, William Stedman from Ireland wow another Irish Wayne J 62 watching should be a whole lot more thumbs up uh well you know that's up to you guys that's up to you guys I don't I don't make it a point to demand likes like some of these channels do they go a little bit crazy with that. Uh, Wayne J says, Jose, I never get got an got an email with the second photo. Oh, oh, yeah, I know. I can't find it. I got to look again. I, I got to look again. I don't know where I had that. That was a long, long time ago. And what it is, it's just a shot of the ocean with the sunset behind them. And this kid is wearing this ridiculously blue, deep blue shirt. That my PA hundred prints kind of a grayish blue, deep dark grayish blue, but my Pro one thousand prints it as a fluorescent blue, literally. So that's what I wanted uh, to send you, but I'm still looking for it. So I have not ignored you yet. No, that came out wrong. I will not ignore you. Per S Stromsheim, I cannot pronounce it. Stroms Stromsheim. We appreciate what you do. Press like uh, guys and gals who's watching dinner time in Norway. So I got to go. I'll watch the rest of the show later. Yep. Uh, just wait until afterwards. Uh, we'll be on for another, what is now, a um, little over two hours um, to go yet. And, uh, of course, later on, it just becomes a video. You can catch it at a later time. You just won't be able to interact. DJ Chit Chat, I would love to show you my setup and teach you as well. Yes, I would love to know how to do that. And yes, they are different inks. Okay, that's what I thought. So what are they based on? Are they like vinyl type inks? Are they more like a solvent style inks or what? But I mean, I want to join that group. I want to learn to do that. Because I do have a heat press, and so I need to put it to use. I have an Epson ST2000 with four eco tanks, and I'm trying to get a neutral. Okay, that's going to be a bit difficult because it's just four, and you don't have gray. So that, that will be a problem. But going to black and white mode, and then if it's a... If you got a blue cast throughout the whole image, you just got to adjust away from blue. Okay. That's all you have to do. And I'll, I'll, I'll show you guys how to do that a little bit later on. Okay. I don't know where that is. My, my in-laws are in my sister, basically, on uh, Northport, which is kind of uh, under... Um, further south from uh, Tampa. They got hit by by the uh, last hurricane. G2393 from Flanders. Wow. Antwerp. Yes. Nice. Love that area. I lived in Belgium for three years. What length of a needle should I use to retract ink from a PFI? Okay, so... Oh, gosh. Let me Let me tell you what that is like i have a similar type cartridge here so this is just a small version this is not long enough okay you will need something longer it could be the way these things are designed these these tanks and not not something this long this is way too long an inch and a half, you know, um, or let's just call it um, 30 millimeters. So one of these, one of these ports is a vent port. It actually connects to an internal tube that's inside the cartridge. On the large cartridges, the 700 ml cartridges, it is the central one. 
So what you need to do, actually, I, I, I go a little bit. I don't extract ink anymore. You pop a vent needle into the vent, a needle to extract ink into the actual central and pull out the ink. You got to be careful. You're going to spill it. It's going to be it's going to be uh, a bit difficult uh, unless you have a very long needle that goes all the way to the bottom. So um, here's what I do. I'm going to show you. Let me go get let me, I didn't think I was going to discuss this, but I'll be right back. I gotta find one more thing here. I wonder if I have them here. No, I stored them somewhere. Anyway, so your big 700 ml cartridges. Whoa. I used to insert the two needles. One to pull ink out and one to allow air to enter. As I am pulling ink out, air can go inside. What I do now, because I'm making these cartridges, I buy these full. And I just drill a hole on the upper end. I I wish I had them one here with me, but I don't. Um, and that makes it a refillable cartridge now. See, these cartridges really don't have anything internally. The large 700 ml ones have, like I said, that vent tube. I took one apart. I took one of these apart. They have a tube with little holes all the way around it. And air goes in there and it sort of aer aerates the ink because they sit vertically, as you well know, on your printer. So they aerate the ink as ink is being drawn out from outside the tube, in other words. So that tube acts as an aerator to agitate the ink because those cartridges just stay there. They don't move. There's no way they're going to be agitated like a regular cartridge on a printhead does. So I have two little needles. I Hold on. You got to see this. Okay, so here is, I have it in my plastic bag. Here is a blue, yeah, blue cartridge. And what I do, I just attach a syringe and I draw ink out. Which one? This one. Okay, so if you look at this, this one is located more toward the center of the of the cartridge itself but the better solution really is to buy 700 ml bottles drill a hole here drill a hole here five thirty seconds of an inch because you want to be able to plug it with this size type plug since i buy these and i never really use them the chip is still brand new I could sell this to someone once it is empty as a refillable cartridge because it can be refilled. And remember that these families of printers, you can disable the chips. We won't get into that. But basically, you end up with a system just like I got on my Pro 1000 that I can now refill whenever I wish before it gets to the point where it's empty, of course. Um, all the chips are disabled. I don't have to buy chips anymore. 
It uses the disabled chips to identify colors so it can still operate. I'm using a sensor system to keep me abreast of when I need to top off a cartridge. There's going to be a system for this type of printer as well, the 2000, 4000, or 2100, 4100, 6100. They all use the same cartridges. They all use the same print heads. So the system is the same. It's just that you need a different type of sensor because it has to be really thin. And it attaches to the side of the printer, cartridge that is, and when it reaches a certain level, it will say, light up and it's time for me to be topped off so you buy whatever ink you want to use that is for those of you who do not want to use oem ink anymore you want to go third party because these will run you uh the retail is 300 dollars each sale you can get them for my two something on ebay they'll be slightly close to getting uh maybe um get to that point where you know they expire officially expire but they're not they're not really expired they're still good so see that i remove that i add ink to my i'm going to have to do that later on i add ink to my chrome optimizer that needs to be topped off while i am weighing it and when it reaches 112 grams it is full to capacity put the plug back on it and attach my sensor back on it and then pop it back into the printer. And that's it. I'm done. That printer now has a, a chrome optimizer cartridge topped off. The chip has no clue I did that. The sensor tells me I did. And so we're we're really pioneering uh, different ways to uh, attack the what these companies have done to us with these chips. Uh, people will say that, oh, the chips are there to just, you know, make sure that everything is okay. No, they did that. They did that on purpose in order for you to not be able to refill. And then it kind of backfired because uh, they came up with resetters and they came up with uh, single-use chips. And, of course, Canon still allows you to disable the chip itself. Oh, okay, that's a different direction. Okay, so you're not my brother-in-law. Okay, <laughs> DJ Chit Chat says, yes, DTF ink is textile pigment ink. Okay. What about, um, I know that printers that directly print on a T-shirt, meaning you have a straight pathway, have to first lay down a titanium white layer and then on top of that they begin to print in color and that titanium white layer has been known to be terrible on print heads it, it causes all these clogs to occur a little bit more often than you wish um, so you just print your image on the transfer film and then that's it you're done does the transfer film have like white because otherwise or you're printing also white ink uh, i don't know i would love to see a, a demo of that mm. i solved the pro the blue cast with the with the four color eco tank by profiling it work on glossy and matte yeah profiling always, always does that yeah it will take care of any kind of um, irregularities in output. Harold Goldberg says, from cool and sunny Richmond. You're sunny? Send some of that up here, man. Um, Pro 100 PCSC, Rick Johnson's can clean carts and Rudy's holders. Pepe Le Pew. You don't mean that little naughty little skunk, do you? Uh, hi, Jose. I have a Canon Pro 100S and bought an EcoTank. 80 28 40 what a waste of money i can say no icc profiles for desktop only the app so is that see if a printer is not meant for photographic printing there are not going to be there are not going to be any profiles available okay just be aware that if it is not a photo printer you're not going to get profile profiles are for photo printing 
uh, not for documents and things like that. So that's why um, you may not have gotten any with that driver. In other words, you install the driver and then you go to your printing application and you don't see profiles listed for that EcoTank 2840. That's because it's not meant for photography. Maybe it's just, you know, a four color only meant for, you know, document printing. That's, that's why that would happen. Okay. Now, so I think a couple of weeks ago, I had a comment from um, somebody referring to the pharmacist. The pharmacist was an individual from one of the printing groups right now. It's called printing, printerknowledge.com. Yeah, printerknowledge.com. Um, and he was not getting approved for my group. And the reason for that may be that you may not have answered the questions. And I'll show you what that means. Let me let me just say, I make it. See, I've had a lot of problems with uh, people that don't really want to join the group. They're not really interested in what we discuss, but they sure try to get in and they will then uh, start spamming and maybe even porno, you know. So well, what I do is I ask you a, a set of questions. And so here are, we, we got three applicants. So let me go ahead and uh, refresh to see if I got any more here. So what I will see is this, guys. So I'll go to my group. That was my regular um, Facebook, by the way. So member requests. So I can either approve them all without looking or I go ahead and look. And so three questions that I want you to answer. So this is what, you know, this person here has 202 friends. He belongs in a member of six groups, joined Facebook 15 years ago. Sounds like me. Lives in Boise, Idaho. Boise, not Boise, you idiot. Boise, Idaho. St studied in computer science at Montana State University. Worked at Pro. Clarity, admin assist, what's up? Uh, what's up to one hour to take care? Okay, so, yeah. So this is it. Please tell us what printer or printers you're interested in, okay? So you see, if you're not into printers, you may not know what to answer. So that'll kind of give me an idea that you just hear, you're not really seriously wanting to join. You just want to join to spam. So you, this guy told me Epson. Well, that's pretty vague. Okay, but I, you know, I accept it. How long have you been printing photos, if at all? Three years. How deep do you want to get into photo printing? Interested in expanding beyond four colors all in one? By answering four colors all in one, I kind of know. You know something about printers. Okay. So we approve you. Simple as that. Rogan stars from uh let's see he's got 700 and you can just read that from jamaica and he answered hp disc jet disc jet ink advantage how long have you been printing photos if at all new how deep do you want to get into very okay you could still be spamming me but i'm going to approve you please tell us what printer so he, canon's image Prograph pro 300 just starting knee deep okay you see that if you do not answer those you're just not going to get approved because i really don't know how genuine you are in you know wanting to learn more or participate in this field that we love so much so the same thing here pro 100 uh he hasn't been printing at all yet and Online business. He just wants to learn how to print for his online business. Approved. That's it. That's all you got to do. If you're not getting approved, it's because I don't necessarily look at this every couple of hours. I look at it every day, maybe every two days sometimes, depend on how busy I am. I don't have a, you know, a secretary or an admin. I did at one time, but they kind of, they thought they had more power than they should have had. And so I had to let them go. And uh, but anyway, that's it. That's all you got to do. Answer those three simple questions and you will be part of this group. And we're over six thousand something members already, which is really, really nice. Um, 
Again, it's all about printing, folks. So make sure either do your homework. If you want to cheat me, do your homework. And, you know, you have to kind of know what to enter. And you'll fool me. But fool me once, fool me twice. Yeah. You know, you know, you know what comes next, right? All right. I do not want to drink Chrome Optimizer. So I best move that out of the way. Okay, so last week, I don't know whether you saw me do this. I think you did. Beautiful print, upside down, of course, of an, half an orange dropping through a tank of water being lit from the back and also some from the front. And it looks amazing. But white background, of course, on the tank. This is what you get. They took, I'm sure, whoever did this, not me. I'm not that talented. Whoever did this, it took several tries. But look what's happening here. You see that? Smudges. And when you get smudges, maybe if you just get a little smudge on the side here, that just means this. Now, one way to tell a head strike is obviously this went through this way. The head always comes from the right. I'm reversed right now, so just, just trust me. This is the right side. The head enters here. If this little corner is peeking above the that very narrow gap, it's going to get hit. Why? Because it is not being supported. It first starts to come out, and there's nothing keeping this down. That's later, okay? That goes under the platen. There's some rollers and some star wheels, and it keeps that paper nice and flat. It doesn't happen later on. It only happens in the beginning or the end. So that's not a head strike. Well, it is in a sense. That's kind of a head rub where the bottom of the nozzle plate literally touched the surface rather than being above that so-called default gap. And the little droplets are sprayed and nothing is touching the paper, only the little droplets of ink. These are rubs. These are printer rubs right there. You can see them. So this paper is relatively heavy. Um, as you can see, it really doesn't bend very easily on its own weight, even on the corner. Maybe it's just a little bit too thick. Maybe it was slightly curled. Maybe my printer was filthy because I've been using it for several months now, nonstop. I may have to clean it. So we opened up the lid. I could see the platen. Took a little Windex, soaked it into my paper towel. And I did this, I had this in the trash, but I kept it just for you guys to see. And continue cleaning, cleaning, just dabbing, dabbing and cleaning and make sure that none of that paper towel came off and, you know, lost itself on that sponge that runs left to right. The full length of the head travel. You have a sponge underneath the plate. And the plate is like a, it keeps the paper down and transports it as well as the rear rollers. It helps everything along the way. In other words, keeps it nice and flat. When it gets to the end and the rear rollers are no longer transporting that paper because it's gone beyond that. Now those little rollers in the plate are trying their best at keeping it flat. If you have a type of tray where the paper comes out and then just begins to droop, guess what happens to the other side? It rises because that paper is underneath that plate and so it acts as a fulcrum. So the front droops down, the rear pops up slightly, gets hit by the printhead. You get smudges again. So what you got to do, lucky for us, these designers finally got it and produced... A really good exit tray. When this paper comes out, it goes uphill a little bit. And what does that do? It causes the rear trailing edge to not pop up. It stays down. I used to have to put like a box of paper here. On my 3800, the PA100, the same thing. Same thing. 
So I have to put, the paper comes out like a three quarter of an inch above the surface of the tray. It's going to droop. It has to. So I put a box that happens to be the same height or thickness and the paper comes out and it just basically glides on top of that box. Nothing is drooping down. Nothing is going to cause that rear or trailing edge to rise up and get smudged. If you're printing on a roll, that's not going to happen because it's a continuous roll of paper. And the paper never gets retracted back into the roll and start all over again. You just basically cut the paper and back it up and it stops on the P800, P900. If you have a roll adapter and you're in roll mode, it's just going to retract it to the starting position, which is beyond the plate. And you are going to waste a couple of inches of paper, regardless of what you're printing, regardless of whatever size. And it does that on purpose because you want that paper to be two or three inches beyond any danger point. Okay. And that's why printing on roll on something like a Canon Pro 200100 or equivalent Epson printer is probably the best way to go. Not only do you have a continuous type of paper coming through, of course, if you're the type that's constantly changing papers and that's not a convenient thing to do, but if you are printing on the same paper for several months, every time you retract, every time you cut, take your finished print and trim it, and then you retract to the starting position, it's just going to start like two inches beyond the plate. And that's safe. See, you're you're good to go. You're never going to have a head strike. Never. Because the area where the print is going to enter is already held down flat. That doesn't happen with single sheets. It does not happen. Okay. So wait a minute before I before I go to the next subject. So here's, if you remember, and you saw my video that I did, where I printed this cool shot in uh, beautiful Ellicott City, Maryland. There's the lady at the store owner on the, on the phone, and she doesn't know I caught her from across the street. But look at that. All the, all the, This was a, a special weekend, and all of the stores were do beautifully decorated, and lots of people were in the area. Then I flipped it over. And I did this one. There is no marks anywhere. That's after cleaning the platen on that printer. I had marks on this thin paper. I, I really shouldn't have. It wasn't a thick paper. It wasn't a paper that was curly. It was perfectly flat. You, you know, look at that. It's just flat. The corners are not up. But I did get some smudges, some bad ones. And, of course, that went into the trash. And the next day, I decided, let me go ahead and clean that printer really well. And this next print I did, did have a smudge, but that was gone after that. No more smudges. So now I got about another couple of months where I have to repeat the process of cleaning that plate. And that's something you got to do. That's part of the maintenance. You just have to do it. Okay. Don't be surprised if you get marks if you neglect it. Okay. That's what happens. Why, yes, that's how they make their money. You got to remember that a, a new model, just like phones, you know, iPhones and other Android phones and all of these different, you know, they have already, they're they're like if several years behind, really, as they release from there. They're, they're way ahead of what you are getting as a, you know, just out of, out of the oven release, in other words. Uh, the same thing with printers. So they're constantly doing their research. There is not much more that can be do with print can be done with printers, uh, unless somehow they discovered. I call it nuclear inks. <laughs> you know, um, inks have have finally met their 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 max output quality. They cannot do better than what they're doing to you know doing so now. So developments on printers are going to be more of features and, and being more um, reliable mechanically. They really don't have a built-in expiration date like people, some conspiracy theorists think they do. Um, 
If you think wasting paths are a built-in expiration date, then sure, okay. Technically speaking, that could be classified as a as a ex expiration date. But like I told you, if you do what I just told you earlier, you're going to extend the life of that Pro 100. Mine is almost 10 years old. In next next August, it'll be 10. Okay. Of course, finally got a bad printhead. I had to replace it. And so, but anyway, you know, that's nothing to do with the ink pads. So that's something that I cannot fix myself. Most shops right now will not do that any longer. They just ask you to buy a new printer. Unless you really find a friendly shop that will do that for you and they can find the pads for your printer, um, then yeah, it's time for a new printer when that happens. So, um, but that doesn't mean it is a built-in, you know, a, a time clock where at a certain date, the printer dies. No. So they make money on the inks, of, of course. Of course. Yeah. That's why a regular cartridge printer costs a lot less for what you're getting as a printer unit than an EcoTank. You're going to pay a lot more for an EcoTank. So right up front, they're making proportionally more money from your purchase, knowingly that the inks that you're going to be using on it are going to be very cheap by comparison. Okay, one, one of these is going to cost you the same as one of these, you know, the regular OEM ones, you know. Uh, you're going to pay like $20 for one of those, maybe $18, $19. You got 13 to 14 ml here. You got 70 and this costs $19, okay? So that's that's the big, you know. So you you think, oh, I'm, I'm robbing them blind now because I'm paying so little for inks. And if you want to go third party, I don't know why you would want to do that uh, on an EcoTank printer, then you can and you will save like, like, Three times more on ink. It'll be almost meaningless what you're paying on inks for producing prints. But then again, you're not going to be selling prints. This is going to be just for your own pleasure, and you're going to be profiling a lot. Um, that's that's the truth. But anyway, um, they make their money on inks. Sure, absolutely. Think about the Pro 100s that were being given away with cameras. You bought a camera, you got a printer. You got a four hundred dollar printer at that time. It was like four fifty. Next time you buy inks, one hundred and twenty dollars for a set of inks. You see that? You didn't pay anything for the printer. Now every three or four months, you got to pay one hundred twenty dollars for inks. Yeah, totally overpriced, but you know that's the way it was. You cannot completely rebel against that, but you have to know how to manage your way through that. That's why my Pro 1000 is all OEM, but I can I can fill cheaply, a lot cheaper than paying sixty dollars every cartridge. This will cost fifty nine ninety nine. I can refill it for about twenty dollars, twenty five dollars maybe. And when I had to buy a chip, that was another twelve dollars. Now I don't have to. They're disabled, zero chip expense now. All I got to do is top off. When I top off, I'm only adding 60 ml of ink because I already have 20. And so my refill, my top off is a lot less. When I top off this, I'm only adding about 8 ml of ink, maybe at the most, because my liquid side was never allowed to go empty. So I'm only topping that area off. Uh, with Precision Colors inks, that's costing me 60 cents, 70 cents per refill. You see what I mean? Even if you even if you could buy dye inks that are in this size category, it would cost you maybe a dollar, a dollar fifty per refill. That's it. Instead of twenty dollars per cartridge. And of course, you can reset those chips. No need to uh, reset them. The Pro One Hundred, that is, and the Pro Ten as well. Yeah, that is their business, inks. They have different, um, a separate department that just handles the ink chemistry and accuracy of their outputs. They are color engineers, and that their goal is to provide the most accurate rendition of what you see. 
Um, but there are limitations. There, they just cannot, you know, produce weird neon-looking colors. The inks themselves are not neon, so they cannot go above or beyond a certain uh, level of of color. And of course, like I always say, color is lands lands on paper, and you got not you got to now illust you know illuminate it from the top and reflect back. It, it takes away half the brilliancy that you see on your screen. Okay, keep that in mind. Don't let that fool you into thinking that, oh my God, I can't sleep because I'm not getting what I see on my screen. My screen is brilliant and my, my prints are dull by comparison. Of course they are. It's paper. It's paper. Pedro says, I will use the PFI 1700. Uh, that's for the Pro 1000, 270 euros to refill my brand new Pro 100. I tried to order the precision colors sensors via my US. Yeah, that's 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 perfect, man. But you got to do the you got to do the the uh, chip disabling correctly. Okay, you cannot wait until a cartridge goes empty. It's not going to work. You have to prep your cartridges by drilling a hole. See, I I use inches. Europe is metric. You have to find out the slightly smaller diameter drill bit, drill bit like this. Oh, do I have one here? Drill bit, you know, for drilling. That happens to be a tiny bit smaller than five, five, 30 seconds of an inch. You drill that hole. Now you got a plug that fits perfectly tight. You top off that cartridge until it weighs 112 grams. This is the only time we go metric here in this country. So 80 milliliters of ink weighs with the cartridge 112 grams. You put that on. The chip was never low or even halfway. You're just going to start to top off these cartridges now. So you always have more ink than your printer thinks you have. And it's not just using your chip to determine that. It's using something mechanical inside your printer. This feeds ink into your printer as needed. It goes into a reservoir. There are internal sensors in there, three of them. They have an upper sensor that tells the printer or this cartridge do not send me any more ink because ink just touched my uppermost sensor so if the ink is that high you don't need to add more ink so that sensor tells the valve to close okay then you begin to print and ink from that reservoir feeds through an ink line into your print head, which has a damper for each color, 12 of them. They're little miniature cartridges. And that damper is always kept full of ink. And that then feeds the nozzles, the channel, yellow, magenta. And you use up ink as you print. That little reservoir directly in front of this cartridge that is installed in your printer begins to drop. Once it drops a certain level, a secondary sensor gets triggered. How? It's now above liquid. It's exposed to air. Sends a signal to that valve that regulates the flow out of this cartridge to open. Ink comes out and fills that reservoir back up to full. It then uh, triggers the upper sensor. The valve closes. That's it. It knows exactly how much ink it takes to top off that reservoir. It knows that. So after many, many cycles of this, it knows how much ink has gone through the, what? The printer. It knows. So when it reaches a point where a certain amount of ink has been used, it triggers the low warning. But you have more ink 
in the cartridge than what you should have if you did not tamper with the cartridge by drilling a hole and always keeping it topped off. See, that's how you fool it. It continues printing. Every time it reaches that low sensor, it opens up the valve, ink comes in, ink level starts to rise, it triggers the upper sensor and closes the valve. Cycle after cycle after cycle of this continues to occur. Eventually, it says, impossible. This cannot be happening. I have used more ink than I should have. Danger, danger, danger. And it will stop. It will give you an error. You will see on your screen of the printer, error 1753. That's it. Press the pause button for five seconds. Just keep holding it and you will see processing. And after that, it goes back to your normal screen. And that channel, whose chip you now disabled, will be showing full. Full? Actually, no, it should be showing nothing. But in the case of the print uh, screen, the printer screen, it shows it as full. On the driver, it shows it as nothing. Okay. So eventually you will reach many cartridges that will be at the low setting. But again, you're not really low. You always have more ink than what the low setting should have. That's how you trick it. Eventually, each one of those low cartridges will reach the point where it says, the printer says, hey, you used up, you're tricking me again. You used up too much ink. Danger, danger, danger. Stops. Error, 1753, press the pause button. Another chip now is disabled. After you get all 12 of them disabled, now it's your job to always keep your cartridges topped off. Even if you do not have the sensor system, you better occasionally weigh the cartridges. Empty, which is you don't want to ever reach that, is 32 grams. Full is 112. So anything in between indicates that you have ink in the cartridges. Top them off. If you have a bottle like I just showed you, it's easy. If you have a bottle like this, this is just water, but you're going to put ink directly into that hole as you are weighing this on top of a scale. When you reach 112, you do it slowly. Don't go crazy. You could have a geyser and have ink all over yourself. You want to take your time at little amounts of ink until it reaches 112 grams remove the bottle wipe the top if you got any leaks or whatever or spills and put the plug back on it reinsert it back into your printer that's it do that to all 12 and you're good to go from now on you don't need any any chips whatsoever they're just there for color identification and not ink level if you want to go back buy new cartridges that's it. Go back, buy new cartridges, and now you have full ink reports again. If you let it go empty without modifying the cartridge prior to that and keeping it topped off, you get a red X. You can press that button all day long. Nothing's going to happen. Okay? Keep that in mind. If you got a Pro 1000 and you want to go that route, you have to... Uh, you know you have to pro, pro, uh, you have to perform that job that modification correctly fix the cartridges by drilling them and always keeping them above a certain level in other words so the printer thinks it has less ink than you actually do and eventually it gets to the point where it just gives up and gives you that error if you don't follow that, you got to start all over again. You got to get a new, a new cartridge and begin again. Yeah, it, it is delicious, man. They have other flavors too. Mark says a uh, Wayne J. Hence my choice for the eighty-five fifty, and not the 
P900. P900 was my original dream as an enthusiast. Um, yeah. Um, let's see. Wait a second here. Oh. Oh, 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 oh. I'm sorry, 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 sorry. I skipped some people here. Hang on. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So next. Okay. Um, what would be the easy fix to keep the paper down to prevent the printhead smudging the paper XP 15,000? Well, the XP 15,000 has a similar tray, but if the, if you notice that the, okay, once the paper, take, just take a look at a job when it's emerging. And I'm not talking about plain paper. That's floppy. That's too floppy. Photo paper. Just look at it. When it emerges, you see it coming out. Figure out what the level of that edge is from the, the the paper tray. And as it reaches further out, is it drooping? If it is, you're going to have to put something there to support it, to maintain that paper at a level condition as it completely prints all the way through and comes out. That's, that's all I can suggest. Um, the XP15000 tray should be very similar to this one, by the way. So... This one has no problems at all. That doesn't mean you're getting guaranteed that you'll never get as much. Of course you will. Uh, it happens every once in a while. And you just got to clean. I haven't cleaned the XP 15,000 yet. I got I to gotta do that. I sent the print job further down to give the rollers a chance to grip. Okay. So you can, you can actually, yeah, you can do that. You can actually position the image on that, that page to give you a more of a lead, more of a leading edge. That will solve that absolutely. You just still got to contend with the rear, though. That's why roll printing is pretty flawless because you always have paper in the front and on the back because you never, you never start. In other words, you cannot print borderless on that edge of that roll after you trimmed it. It starts further inward. So... Wayne J says, uh, Mark Flanagan, you're exactly right about that. Okay. About the ink and the paper manufacturers or printer manufacturers. Okay. 59 people watching. You better. You better believe it, man. That's good stuff. Hi from Colorado. That's Dan Smedra. Nice to have you. Yeah, um, to be honest, if if this printer had not produced what I, you know, would expect something like the Pro 1000 to produce or something the same level of quality or presumable, you know, presumable quality, I would have just said, okay, great, thank you. But, you know, nah. But it's really good. I mean, come on. How? Let me show you something I just did. This was on a video that I just did the other day. So I went to Ellicott City many years ago. Ellicott City is a very old city. It's like 1700 something uh, in Maryland. And it has a, you start from the top of the hill, you go down, it's got like five or four or five creeks that converge into one. That's why it floods so horribly. Uh, it has caused ridiculous amounts of damage. Um, so far, so good. They did a lot of uh, civil engineering work uh, to divert those creeks so that maybe this will not happen again. But there is a big river at the bottom of the hill so that the town is just maybe several blocks long. It's built on a on solid granite. It's got creeks running underneath the street. It's fabulous. And it's old style and lots of quaint shops. And anyway, a pleasure to go visit and go eat and spend the evening there. So this dress shop across the street from this awesome little gift shop had this hanging from the uh, front. So I went across the street, used my zoom lens, and shot that. And this was done on the 8550. Okay, there you go. This is done on Konica A3 paper. It's a glossy paper 
from Konica, and it is A3, the uh, metric size. Let me back up so you get more accurate rendition from the lights rather than my monitor. And this is a freaking match to my, my monitor display when I was printing this. This area here is, is the match as far as you would think the colors are more. No, I'm looking at this because this is kind of neutral, kind of neutral looking. And if that's off, then everything else is going to be off. So the magentas and the oranges and that central dress are spot on. Spot on, mate. Yes. And right here, this is more of um kind of includes more oranges. And then this one on the right, my your left, um, is more subdued and it exactly matches the original image. 8550. So if if you can do this, it it, it is twice better in person, by the way. If you were here with me, uh, you you would want this. You would want me to give it to you. And if you were here, I would have given it to you. Why? Why not? So anyway, yeah. If you can do that, by all means, it can it can really print. And I'm looking for, in the case of that image, I was looking for some of the areas that maybe could not be reproduced. Again, you look you're looking at a printer that only has yellow. Cyan, magenta, one gray, which has no color, and one black ink. The black dye ink is actually a deep purple. That has to be corrected for, by the way. And the print engine does that. But, it, you know, black dye ink is not neutral. It's purple, like a magic marker. If you take a magic marker and, and write on a piece of plastic and then take an alcohol swab, you'll see nothing but purple ink. Okay. That's the way it is with these dye inks as well. So it's difficult for them to be able to produce a neutral result. What they are used for is after your three primary colors or secondary colors, in this case, yellow, cyan, magenta are mixed together. They're, theoretically, they should be able to produce a very deep, almost black. And then black comes in and puts the final accent, if you will. The gray is used to be able to um, make up for the fact that there is not a light magenta and a light cyan, like most other photo printers would have available. The XP15000 does not have that either, but it has what? Red, okay? So something like that image would have print beautifully on the XP15000, assuming you got a paper that has a profile that matches that printer's ink set. And now we're using precision colors. It's going to be slightly different. It's not going to be the same as OEM. So with this, you're sticking, we're sticking with OEM at this point. So let's see, wait a second here. Okay, so I think this is the one after Wayne having a great time with the 8550. Yeah. Uh, isn't everybody? Yeah. And and just think, if you want to do documents, you got a tray underneath a cassette loaded with paper. And you just leave it on auto and it will, you know, you, you open something in Word or whatever text uh, type tool you use and print it. It's not going to print on the upper tray using your photo paper it's going to print on you know and if you just choose a lower quality in other words it'll be faster it prints very quickly you can do all your documents that way let me see i do not think that is going to happen according to jose and probably too also i am very interested in jose's upcoming videos regarding qmh alignment of larger prints yeah I think he was referring to something else there. I wanted more than 13 inch as I am, I am going to be printing for club competition. P900 was recommended for quality because prints bigger than 13 inch typically compete better. Yeah, that's true. The P900 is, is awesome. I got 
Um, last week I showed you guys that. Um, I think, let me see. This is the paper I printed that set of dresses with the window display. I've got three examples here that I'll quickly go through. I have some Ilford. We're going to be doing some of this later on if we have time. It's a it's a sample pack. It's called the Gallery Series Prestige Series. I can't even remember what this was. Ilford Pearl or something like that. No, that's not the pearl. Um, the one with the oranges, the print with the orange floating around, that was Ilford Pearl. You saw that earlier. That had a smudge on it. So this is another paper, and it's, oh, I know what this is. This is that charcoal paper from uh, some weird company. Anyway, I got a lot of weird paper, so bear with me. And you can see there's a color cast, okay? Then I realized, as I was looking at it, under my overhead lighting, all of these lights were turned off. I realized, because it was next to another paper, that the paper base itself has a cast. It's, it's a very toned type paper. And so that may be what is causing this. But this is not going toward the warm side. This is going toward the cool side. Had I printed, say, something that is more nautical as far as subject matter, matter goes, maybe something like a bunch of snowy cliffs with deep blue shadows, then this would have worked, okay? But this is just a, a person with a, with a lantern on a spooky cobblestone street, and it's just a shadow. I could print that on black and white mode and slide the slider, the not the slider, but the little icon, that controls color on the color wheel and adjust it for that. It would have taken possibly another print and I would be satisfied. But it's almost neutral. It's just slightly, slightly toned. Again, 8550. Actually, from back here, it's not that bad. Hmm. But this is what I wanted to show you guys. So we were talking about, since, since somebody started talking about the P900, I decided to go back to uh, exploring this. So I wanted to know what can the P900 do on glossy paper? So individual who is here with us today, I send them this image because it had a lot of white areas. So every one of those little flames is specular. It's 255, pure, pure white. So if this ink set on the 900 has even a, the smallest degree of problems with gloss differential, it would show up, especially on a nice glossy paper like this. So the paper, base paper gloss, is glossier than the deepest areas here where you got the most amount of ink. So if I compare this to this, this is glossier than this. But big deal, really. If this had been, and he sent me another image, by the way, that did not have any kind of specular highlights, and it is even glossed throughout. So, yeah, there is no problem with the Pro, no, the P900 printing on glossy. For your competition work, I would probably recommend a non-glossy paper or something with a very low gloss level. Uh, and then you would have no problems at all, especially if you process your images so you never have a white and you never have a pure black, okay? Always have something, a tone above black slightly and below white slightly. I could go back and adjust this in Lightroom and produce a slight, the lightest possible gray 
253, uh, 254, and maybe one for black instead of zero, 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 one, one, one. And then I would get an even smoother result. Now, on the P900, apparently there are some settings that you can adjust to uh, basically smooth out the gloss because they know it exists. But as you can see, I got nothing to complain about. This is gorgeous. Now, how accurate can a Pro 1000 match this? So I gave him this image. He printed it on HP paper, which is not even recommended for an Epson printer, and got this. And I'm, I'm going like, well, damn, this is gorgeous, man. This is beautiful. Do I have the other one here? I want to show you his image. Here we go. Of a bald eagle. It doesn't have the colors that my image. I did that on purpose. I wanted to see what that printer can do. This is more subdued. This is this is actually, it looks like it was flash lit. Okay. And the eagle didn't know he was being photographed. So let's go back to this because there is a problem. There is a problem that requires yeah, it requires a pixel paper like me to 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 be able to discover. Printers with a specific set of inks do not always get along with every single paper out there. So especially HP and Kodak. Apparently their coatings have a certain property that causes what we call bronzing. I don't know whether you can see this. Probably it's almost imperceptible right here, this area right here. It requires a certain type of lighting, and you will see it. It's kind of a metallic, kind of copper-like um, look. It's kind of a weird metallic reflection, and it depends on what angle you look at it. And it, it all has to do with ink not getting along with that coating. Had this been printed on Epson paper, there'd be no such thing as what I see on the HP. So that's just something pertaining to HP. Let's look at the P, the Pro 900, I mean, no, I'm sorry, Pro 1000 with full gloss or chroma optimizer application. And ICC profile, this is the Canon paper. ICC profile for the Canon paper. This is the HP paper, no ICC profile for the HP paper. For a P900, there's no such, no such thing unless you make your own. So he probably used ICC profile for this glossy paper. But look. <laughs> Can you tell me the difference? Of course not. Better yet, watch this. I'm going to have to back up for this. P900. I'm sorry, 8550, I'm confused. Okay, P900, the big one, Pro 1000 on Canon paper, this is HP. And then this is the dual-sided uh, luster from, uh, it's polar luster from Red River using that profile for the 8550. So, What do you guys think? Here, let's put it all together. Maybe the image is so strong that any slight differences just kind of disappear. But that looks like a pretty darn good match to me. Three different animals, basically. And they produce pretty much identical, almost identical results using on one of them is just the epson profile i'm sure that he just picked an epson glossy profile or paper choice and let epson the epson layout tool handle color management per 1000 on canon paper using the canon profile and again red river uh polar luster using the red river profile for the 8550 and the results are pretty much identical
and people still tell me they cannot get two printers to match. And I didn't even have control over the 13 by 19 that my friend here produced for me. I just assume he did it correctly. You see, I didn't even ask. But you can see that both, all three printers produce the same results on similar type papers, glossy, glossy, and luster. Wait a second here. I, this chat is advancing faster than I can keep up with it. Hang on a second. Okay, so here we go. Larry Eberhard from Maryland. Where in Maryland? I am just north of Washington, D.C., off of Connecticut Avenue, University Boulevard. That's my area, Kensington. I'm scared of how high the cartridges will go, cartridge prices will go. I'm already seeing P900 cartridges up over $60,000 in the U.S. In some places, I've been paying about forty-two dollars before discounts up to now. Yeah. Yeah. That's where the 8550 just, you know, imagine if I was doing this as a business and not because you got to realize I spend more on supplies than I make on YouTube. Okay. Yeah, there are ways to bring in money. There's super chat here tonight. You can donate a few bucks here and there, but really there is not much. You rely on your views and you rely on ads being placed on your videos. So when it comes down to the end of the year, I have spent more than I have earned. So, uh, and that has to do with ink costs, paper costs, that sort of thing. So if I was doing this, for money, for business, I would have to choose a printer that allows me to produce great results at a much lower per unit cost. That would have to be that. Now, of course, you're dealing with dye, which is less likely to last 100 years. So you would have to, if you were selling, you would have to treat those uh, prints uh, accordingly with a protectant spray, uh, either provide them uh framing that will protect the prints even more uv glass that sort of thing and that adds to your production costs so you know it's very difficult yeah ink ink is a killer robert says i own a pro 100 xp 15000 Using PC inks, Rick Johnson refurbished cartridges, QMH1, editing in Photoshop. Okay. Yeah. So how how you been uh, doing with those that combination, the two? Okay. Jose, so clear, Pro 1000. I get the kit, which is, which one is best? Drill, fill, cap. Third-party inks will... It be correct color. Well, you gotta, you gotta. It depends who you buy your inks from. Precision Colors sells you um, eight of the twelve colors are third party. Those eight colors have been kept third party because he was able to reach the level of output quality of the equivalent OEM. Does that make sense? So four of those could not be made in third party form that could match the output of the equivalent OEM inks. So Chrome Optimizer, that you when you buy the kit from Precision Colors, you get OEM Chrome Optimizer, you get OEM yellow, red, and blue. Those three colors, yellow, red, and blue, are the ones that cannot be duplicated in third party. No one has been able to. So if you buy your refill kit from somewhere else, you're going to get full, you know, third-party level uh, inks. And your output is going to be a little bit less uh, accurate if you when you're comparing to OEM um, than you do when you buy Precision Colors because you're getting four that are actually OEM. You can buy all 12 OEM from them as well. So no one else, no one, absolutely no one else is 
providing you with the option to buy 12 loads of OEM inks for your Pro 1000. No one. So it just depends who you buy from. If you can live with the lower, um, not quality, not lower quality, but lower accuracy or less of a match, if you will. Okay, Toronto. That's where uh, Precision Colors lives. How big a difference is there between Canon, Epson Premium Photo Papers? I have only tried a large Canon Premium Photo Papers so far on the 8550 using similar herbs. Uh, both of them are extremely good. Remember, there's only like seven uh, photo paper mills or paper mills that produce photo papers in the world. So, you know, a lot of the papers that are the expensive brands are really made by the same mill that makes the lower cost, same quality that Red River sells, for instance. So yeah, both of them are good. When you deal with uh, with Canon on an 8550, you're gonna probably need to make some uh, profiles. After your experiment and your sprint using the nearest possible matching uh, paper type, uh, if you get good results, if the results are neutral, then you probably don't need to make any profiles. You can, you can live with that. Uh, it's not gonna be 100% perfection, which doesn't exist anyway, but you'll be able to live with that. Otherwise, if you have the ability to create custom profiles, I always suggest you do that anyway, with no matter what paper you use on whatever paper, whatever printer with whatever inks, custom profiling is always number one. Larry says, Jose, I'm not a professional photographer. I like to take photos of shorelines from a drone. Okay, after watching your videos, I'm learning toward the, I'm leaning toward the 8550. Thanks again for your in-depth videos. I, I also take uh, drone photog uh, drone photographs. Um, yeah. Do you have uh, such interesting points of view that you cannot possibly um, get while you're at ground level or even on a, on a hill? Because you can go higher than that. You can actually f fly up to 400 feet, legally speaking, above ground level. So... Imagine the shots you can get. You can do panoramas also, where you where you pan the drone, like you were on a tripod. The drone just sits there. You go to the left, click. Go 80 percent to the right, click. Eighty percent to the right, click, and then join them all together or stitch them together with uh, software. All right. Hi, Gretchen. Um, did you contact me? You're supposed to contact me about possibly coming on as a guest. Please do that. I may end up with the EcoTank 8550 to supplement my P900 when printing 13 inch or smaller prints. Yeah, absolutely great idea. And again, it, it, it takes away that expense. Once you get past the initial expense, which is, it could be 800 bucks retail. You get it for less sometimes they have, uh, Black Friday, they had it for like six something. Uh, so, yeah. And then, you, you know, you're printing for pennies, literally. Larry Everhart says, I am down in Scotland next next to Point Lookout State Park. I don't know where that is in Scotland. But we have a, we have a Point Lookout here as well. Robert says, uh, currently I'm disabled, so my printing is more or less stopped. My Canon is being rested. The XP15000 being a cold head, I am using that one. Enjoy learning. Okay. All righty. Let's see what else we got to talk about. Somebody asked about storing photo papers. I stack my boxes, I hate to say. Some people say, you know, stand them up. Some people say stack them. Think about it. If you have a box of paper and you lay them level, horizontal, more than likely those corners are going to stay flat because of the weight of the paper. 
So to me, that's not really much of a, you don't really have to get fancy. If you have, I don't have the luxury of a beautiful office-like environment in my print room. I have some shelves here and there, and I just pile up the boxes. And when I need to get to another box, I take it out. And that's it. And that's all I need to do. Somebody came up with a very fancy way to do that. And uh, I thought, oh, wow. You know. Okay, Wayne said, no flash on the eagle photo, just midday light. Okay. Oh, that's why on the party cloudy. So I checked that. Um, I actually um, was looking at my photo, even though it kind of looked extreme. I did a gamut check, and it, it was pretty much clear. So everything was in gamut. And I think that's why all three examples happen to be such a close match to each other. But I, I got to search high and low for that image. It's, that's the one, that's the only image that was not able to be produced correctly by my P900, P800, I'm sorry. The P900 probably can't because it's got violet ink. That would be the same, same style or same situation as the Pro 1000 with this blue ink. Wow, whatever that is, uh, NOC. Hmm. Appreciate that. Always can always can use a super chat. Appreciate that a lot, guys. All right. So, I own a Pro One Thousand and find that my black matte black channel seems to clog more often. Well, I had coincidentally, I had a problem a while ago with my Pro 1000. And that was because I never printed on matte paper. So apparently, because, because of this, if you say don't print for three months, the printer will just sit there idle. It will not use ink until you try to print again. It runs a global, all 12 channels get affected cleaning cycle but since every time i printed i printed on a non-matte paper then really that matte black ink was not really exercised a lot so that cleaning cycle that precedes that next job after say three months of not printing may not be enough okay so that might be the reason for that and that'll happen with either photo black as well so if you do not print on, if you print on nothing but, say, matte paper, photo black is hardly ever used. Pro 1000 is an unusual printer, and so are the other ones, the higher ones. It does use both, but at a much different proportion. So on matte paper, say you use 99% matte black ink and 1% photo black, just to keep it kind of flowing. But if you let it sit for three months, and then you attempt to print again, that may be too much, okay? And then the ink, that particular black ink that was not used sufficiently enough may be clogged, and it may result in, you know, you having to run another extra cleaning cycle. Ka-ching! Uh, but, you know, with the, with the Pro 1000 and similar other printers, you don't have to run a global cleaning cycle. So after you attempt to print again and you run what seems to be like a 15-minute procedure, do the nozzle check right after that and determine whether the whatever channel, any channel requires a little bit of extra help. And if they do, then you do this. Okay, let me go ahead and load up the driver because I wanted to show you guys. In fact, That was one of the subjects I was going to cover. Let me go and delete that one. We'll go ahead and jump to that because it's very much has to do with what we were talking about. So let me find the Pro 1000. The same thing applies to even the Pro 100 as well. Also the Pro 10 and just about any other photo printer from Canon. 
So I'm going to go ahead and pop this over to the other screen. Hopefully it'll stay put. I've been having problems with uh, things kind of dropping out of here. Uh, so you're going to go to maintenance. And then you're going to go to your cleanings, cleaning options. So the first one, you see it only has one droplet. So that, that basically indicates it's going to use a certain amount of ink. So this one will use less ink than this one and a lot less ink than this one. This will be a system cleaning. Mm. I had to do that when I had that mad black problem. It literally was blank. I don't know what caused that. And only a system cleaning solved it. Okay, so let's go ahead and just click on this. And we will get this window. I'll drag it over there. So never do this, folks. Look at your nozzle check first. Determine what colors or channels are affected. If there are only, say, one color affected, in this case, what was it? Matte black. Then group two. Just choose group two only. See, these print heads are segmented. You can see right there, two different segments. See that? This is a 9500 Mark II. This will be exactly the same as the Pro 10 or the Pro 300. Each segment has five channels. So if you need to only run a color that lives in this segment, don't run a global one. It will affect and waste ink on the other five color so at least you can save some ink by just choosing the group that contains the color that is affected now you can only choose one group at a time if you have say photo magenta is acting up matte black is acting up and blue is acting up then yeah you got you have no choice you got to run a, an all color one okay that would be the only time you do that don't waste ink don't be silly, in other words, like I used to do, and run global when only yellow was affected. That is wasting ink on all the other 11 channels unnecessarily, all right? I'm going to leave this open because we're going to be discussing another subject pertaining to the driver. Gosh, are we going to get to print anything? I don't know. Maybe not. Okay, I might as well go back to the driver because I do need to show you guys something important. So here we are back in the driver. I want to go back to the quick setup page. And disregard any of this stuff. It doesn't really matter. You may not notice. Let me go back to a specific paper size, like letter. Letter size. You may not notice that your printer driver was set to borderless. Okay, that, that may be something you don't even notice. In fact, many times it is set to a borderless condition as a matter of a default. So you have to go in and check, you know, physically check. Because if you want to print on something that is not a standard size, being on borderless mode, you know, it's not going to allow you to do that. So what am I talking about? I'm talking about creating a custom size, paper size. In other words, say, for instance, I don't know, 9 by 12. Well, you can't buy 9 by 12 paper. It doesn't exist, right? As far as I know. So let's go to the letter, uh, the printer paper size option, and we'll... Click and we'll go all the way down and I don't see I don't see any custom size option here. All I see is paper sizes. Well, what you are seeing as are the standard paper sizes that can be printed onto borderless, meaning edge to edge. In other words, I, I had one here just a second ago, right here. Edge to edge. So if you don't have a, a standard paper chosen, 
you're not going to be allowed to print borderless. So because I have borderless printing chose, chosen here, I'm only shown the sizes that I can print to borderless. But I want to do a 9 by 12 paper size. It's impossible. You can't do it while you are on borderless. So if that happens and you don't see your option for border for for custom size, that means you're probably in borderless mode. So we'll remove that. Now, when I click on that, look at that. Look at how many more papers I have. A lot of those are just simply not considered sizes that can be printed to borderless, edge to edge. So now we can go to custom. Look at that. And here we can enter nine. The width is going to be nine. So 9.00 by, what was it? 12. And hit OK. Now I have a 9 by 12 paper that I can use. As long as I'm on custom, that will be the paper size. When I go to my layout tool, I can actually see a 9 by 12 layout. And I can then drop my image onto and position it anytime, any, any way, shape, or form I want. Okay? So remember, that's, that's what happens. When you are in borderless mode, whether on purpose or accidentally, you're not going to have access to a multiple number of paper sizes because they're just not considered standard, okay? Thank you. Stephen Polboy, hi, Jose, I have an 8550. I want to know how to get the proper colors from a picture I scanned on Lightroom Classic. Scanned, scanned, and then tried to print, but picture was much too pink. It's your settings, buddy. Um, yeah, I don't know what you mean by scanned into Lightroom Classic. I mean, you mean, you probably mean you, you know, imported it in. If you have the correct workflow, you're not going to get a color cast. I've proven that like over and over and over again. Okay, in Lightroom, just in the print module. Let's, let's look at that. By the way, hang on a second. What is this? <gasps> Holy cow, man. Thank you. Appreciate that. It's on sale at B&H. Awesome. Grab it, man. Grab it. Because that doesn't happen often. Thank you. Thank you for the super chat. Appreciate that. Let's look at Lightroom. You're using Epson paper. I hope this works. Let's see if it opens up without any kind of a hassles here. It's opening up in my other monitor here. Come on, baby. Ever since they updated all of these, ah, it takes forever to load. I used to not have problems with that before. Okay, so let's just open up anything. How about this one? Let's go to full screen. Okay, so let's just say this is now ready to be printed. And, oh gosh, I hate that. Oh, see that? Now what? I tell you, these applications have become the most hungry, power-hungry applications ever. Where in the heck is the... to switch over to... See, they changed this, and I cannot make head sales. Okay, here we go. Print. So we're going to print this. And let's just say that's the layout we want. Forget about anything else. We're not going to worry about the layout. We're going to worry about management. So let's say I am printing on an 8550. So let's go ahead and go here to the lower left and choose the 8550. There it is. We'll look at the properties. Again, this is not QImage, so you have to do everything manually. 
and we're going to print on say premium photo paper glossy and we want high quality and that is okay at that point now we got to make a choice do we want to print letting lightroom control color or do we want the driver to control color let's let lightroom control colors so you're going to click on more options make sure you have custom click advanced and no color management so we don't want the driver to control color boom now the driver's not controlling color as i said we got to let lightroom control color now how do we do that see where it says manage by printer i'm going to click on that and other we got to search manually search for that particular profile and we got to go find our 8550 let me move this over here so you can see what I'm looking at. We got to look at our 8550 and look for it. So it will be Epson. We're still on Canon. So Epson 8550. And we want to get the glossy, premium glossy. Here we go. We're going to click on that box. Okay. And now we're ready to print. That's it. All you got to do now is hit print right here and proceed. You have glossy chosen as your media type. You have print sharpening. This is all what they call uh, pre-print sharpening. Of course, look at that. That's that's the wrong layout. We don't we're, like I said. We're not worried about that at this point. We just want to go ahead and print. If you print this using Epson paper, you should be able to get good results. Assuming, of course, that you didn't edit this on an on a monitor that was not properly calibrated. This is zoom to fill turned off and on. Uh, let's see. We can uh, change this by adjusting our margins. You can see that what the margin adjustments do. Just in case you were wondering about that, see that you can position your print anywhere you want. So I always keep that at minimum. But anyway, that if that's what I wanted, again, this is we're not dealing with a layout here. We just want to print an IKEA rendition. You would hit print. As long as you're printing on Epson paper, there's a profile on the 8550 for that paper. You got the driver set to no color management, and you got Lightroom set to color management using that profile. You should not get a color cast. If you do, I, I don't know what else to tell you. You should not. You should not get a color cast. Let me go back to me. It, it's actually quite simple once you get the hang of it. Now, if you really want automation, consider Q Image, man. Q Image handles this for you and never forgets what you did prior to say you did yesterday some work and everything was perfect and you go to bed and you come back the next day and you don't remember what you did q image remembers what you did and will reload everything you had that allow you to reach that state of near perfection again nothing is perfect Okay, so this is going to be kind of neat. I'm going to show you something in Lightroom. Lightroom or Photoshop? Photoshop. Let's go to Photoshop. You're working on images that you... That's not what we want. Let's try this again. Once Photoshop opens, I'll go ahead and drag it over there and give you a bit of a demo. And you can do this as well in Lightroom. Um, but simply what I did was when, when people convert a color photograph image, let's just call it into black and white, often what happens is that colors that were of similar density, they could be different. It could have been, uh, for instance, it could have been 
a red and a green. But when you turn them into a black and white, it looks the same shade of gray. They blend together. If they were touching, they just blend together. Blah. You need to be able to adjust each of those colors while you are in black and white mode. And this is where the little trick comes in. Let me, let me go ahead and drag that over there. And please don't crash on me. Gosh. We're going to go ahead and jump over to that side. And we're going to open up a file that I have on my desktop. Sometime today, thank you. Come on. There we go. And it is a Photoshop file. Let's see. Okay, here we go. This is it. Okay. So here's the converted uh, image. But this is what it used to look like. Now, here we have, let me let me move this out of the way. So here we have a deep red and a very light cyan. But watch what happens. Uh, there is a difference, but look at this here, right here. We have a shadow and then this color. But when you convert to black and white, it just kind of blends together. We don't want that. We want to be able to adjust colors while we are in this mode. And the way to do that is this. Let me let me go to full image here so that we can see better. You don't have to look at me. We're going to go to, oh, wait a second. My little live counter here is blocking the way here. Let me, let me move this slightly out of the way so I can reach that. So we're going to go to image, adjustments, black and white. Unfortunately, now I cannot move my, my uh, uh, layout all the way up again, but watch what happens. So remember what was in red, for instance. What did we have that was red? So let me drag this over. This is what we have. So now we have full control of reds, yellows, greens, cyans, blues, and magentas. And also we can change the tint and adjust the saturation while we are in black and white. So let's go and see what happens when I move the red slider. Remember those backgrounds that were sort of red? See them hardly change at all. Let's try yellow. Why isn't that working? Okay, now, now I'm confused. Hang on one second, guys. Hang on one second here. It worked yesterday. <laughs> so black and white mode. And let's drag that over here. Make sure that it is activated. Huh. Well, I'll be damned. What if I do this? What if I minimize that? And I try this again. Anyway, what is supposed to happen, and you're supposed to be able to have full control. I don't understand why this is not happening. Okay, let's start from a full color image and proceed to do that all over again. Let me go ahead and open. I think I, think I have to start from scratch. That's what it is. We are live, folks. This is this is like, you know, as we go here. So let's see. We'll open up this one. Okay, let me move that over. And here we have very colorful looking image. Again, I'm going to have to drag this down a little bit, tiny bit, so that I can access image. Adjustments, black and white. There we go. So now we're going to go ahead and do this. Let me slide the color adjustment over so you guys can see what I'm talking about. 
this should work now. Here we go. So you can see that I can make the blacks, I can make the reds that were in the background super dense to make whatever that was a lot more um, separated, let's just say, from the background. You can play all day long with these adjustments. Not too much yellow here. You see that? Not too much yellow is being affected. Greens, let's see. Again, not too much greens. That image didn't have too many greens. Oh, blues, look at that. Science, I mean. I can make that area there super dark. Look at that. You see how I am only affecting the region that contained blues. This area here, probably not affected at all. You see that? Oh, I can go completely black or I can go the opposite. So this gives you full control where you normally would not have any control. Okay. Let's try a real image. Let me go back and see if I can find. Let me close that. We'll try something that is not an abstract like that, something with real people and uh, something we can relate to a little bit better. Come on. Let's see. Da -da 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 -da. If I got something with flowers, maybe. How about this orange? Yeah, we'll do the orange. This should be good. So remember, remember where the colors exist. So we have bright orange here, a semi yellowish white orange peel, and of course, nothing but cyan's and other uh, related shades in the water splash. So we should be able to really affect that drastically. So let's go to black and white mode. We'll slide this over. See that little overlay always always shows up. Um, oh, there it is. This time it showed up over there. So that just doesn't have any contrast at all. Uh, it's just blah. It, it's awful. Let's go to yellow because that's a component of orange. Let's let's lighten that. Let's go to red. You see that how I'm affecting that greatly. Let's go to cyan. Watch. Or that. That's kind of a reverse. I don't like that. Let's go to blue. Not much effect. Well, here we go. So we want we want to have those highlights. You see what's happening? See what's happening here? It's gone, it's just blah. And here it adds contrast. So now what we need to worry about is just, basically just adjust those yellows and the reds. See what see what happens if I do that? You could, you could make a blood, a blood orange if you wanted to, but right about there. So now we have more contrast than we early had, and there's your original. So if you accept that, then this photo will be converted to black and white with those particular adjustments. So it's just something to have fun with, folks. It's just another option that you have available. You can do that in Lightroom as well. It's a little bit more um, user-friendly, actually, in Lightroom. Convert your image. In other words, you can actually duplicate it make a virtual copy and then turn it to black and white and just your sliders any way you want. You can dodge and burn. You can adjust contrast later while you're in black and white mode after you made your color adjustments. It's really, really awesome. It allows you to really change the look of your black and white converted, converted images. Don't just take a color image and then print it using black and white mode. Please convert it first to black and white. Make all of those tonal adjustments. If you have two different colors that kind of look the same shade of gray, choose to lighten one or darken one, uh, depending on what the density is originally or the perceived density. Like yellow obviously seems brighter than red to me, but it could end up being the same shade of gray. 
so you can lighten that yellow uh, selectively by doing that. Yeah, that's what I do. I, I just stack them. Yeah, it did switch. Sorry. All right. So let's see. Do, 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 do. I think we can get away with using what time is it? We got half an hour. Let's do some prestige prints. Let's see what we got here. So we'll open up the box. I originally took the contents of several boxes and combined them. So we have that mono silk. I think we did that. I have a regular sheet of paper here. I wrote down mono silk. And then uh, we have some smooth pearl. We have um, gold fiber silk. I don't know what to pick. We have no profiles for these, by the way. Oh, this is kind of neat. Check this out. It's a matte, really a cotton artist texture. Wow. This is super textured. Wow. What could we possibly... And heavy. Oh, my God. That's, that might be a problem. Who knows? Let's, let's see what we can do. Wow. This is almost as heavy and texture as the Canson paper. This is the printable surface. But again, look. Look at the curvature. So we want to we want to take care of that. So I'm going to counter curl each corner the opposite way. I want to do that before I even even attempt to print. If you buy this in a roll and you have a roll a printer capable of using a roll, that's not a problem. The roll is always going to be installed and kept flat. So okay, so I want to counter curl it this way as well. Make sure that now it's not as curly as it, as it was before, a little bit better. Uh, I want my corners down a little bit, but not too much. Okay, now what can we possibly choose for this? What kind of paper choice can we possibly choose? Um, if you go to the so-called Ilford site, uh, they don't have... Hang on. They don't have profiles for the 8550. They don't consider it a photo printer. They don't. So all we can do is pick a similar surface. And the closest we can pick is one of the matte paper choices. So let's load this up. We'll do this. We're going to add a, a half inch border all around. We will go ahead and... Open up Q image. And then we'll go ahead and find us a good image we can possibly print with. And uh, I also have a breathing color uh, box or pack here. And we're just going to have to do that next week. Um, You guys were really helpful this week and asked a ton of questions, so I really do appreciate that. So, okay, so let's go ahead and move over our Q image over to the other side. Remember, I had a problem. Every time I loaded an image, it would cause the stream to freeze up. But Mike Cheney taught me how to eliminate that problem. It just takes a little bit longer to um, queue up an image. What should we print? I don't know. Let's see. Oh, that looks kind of nice. There's our image that uh, we sent to our friend to produce on the P900. Now, you, here's one possibility that you, you have to consider. So we have a matte paper with a very rough texture. 
you're not going to print a shot of an aircraft carrier that is a stark metallic you know object or or a fighter jet you're going to print something that is more pastel and artistic looking okay maybe these flowers right here so let's go ahead and set up the driver correctly here not the driver but cue image correctly here let me go ahead and go to full i'm going to pick up our printer Q image ultimate in QMH Ultimate here, the Eco Tank 8550. Notice how many I have. So, Ultra Premium Photo Paper Luster. Not Luster, no, that's not what we want. So, let's see what we have available. So, we have Premium Presentation Matte, Velvet Fine Art Paper. Hmm. That's a different texture that's actually very smooth and it's sort of like a burrito coated. So, we probably don't want that. So, we either have Presentation Paper Matte or premium presentation paper mat is one better than the other in this case let's go ahead and go with premium presentation mat now i normally let the printer dr uh, driver control color because qmh does it for us automatically but i have been told by mike cheney that i should manually do this by suggesting paper profiles and then once i am shown what the suggested profiles are choose that profile so Notice that there isn't really a premium presentation. Well, there is a premium presentation mat right here, but the other paper mat is just simply called mat. So we'll choose that one. It puts it right on the top. So you can go ahead and click on it, hit click open. And here we're going to make sure that we have relative colorimetric chosen and black point composition. We want all of the all of the shades even the ones that are close to pure black if they do exist not to be blocked up and that's where that comes into play make sure you choose that if you looked at me uh i think it was last week when i did the uh so-called um what was that in i did it in photoshop um i am at a loss here where I show you what the effects of a profile would do, um, you saw the effects. If you if you if you do not have black point compensation turned on, it blocks some of the shadows. Okay. Now we're going to go ahead and load. So let's let's just experiment here a little bit. Print more and specify one dimension. This is a paper border 0.5. So we're going to have a nice border just in case. We're going to give it a little bit of a, of a you know, space there to begin to print. We don't want to do borderless here. And look at that. Now, I had a score around that, so maybe we will not use that one. Let's go ahead and choose something. Oh, wow. Is this going to print? I also had a stroke around that. Let's remove that stroke. I'm going to go ahead and edit that out. I'm going to go ahead and just simply remove it. You're not seeing me do that, but you see me do the crop before. I can show you what I'm doing here. So I'm in the editing mode here. I'm going to just go ahead and click inside that stroke and just remove it. Well, I have to be over there in the other monitor. Click and drag. Oh, I have it on lock, unlock, and now I can remove it. So that that will keep me from uh, destroying my my uh, ratio. So that is a good thing to have set. Uh, do we want to sharpen this? Let's see what the oh my resolution is actually quite low, uh, eighteen forty nine by eighteen forty eight. It's not almost square, but not quite. So let's go ahead and add just what the heck. We're printing a matte paper. Let's do 2 by 200. It's going to give me an example. We're just going to blindly accept it. I trust that with my life actually done. And OK. And here we go. So I want to, I, I don't want to crop it. I want to have the whole thing available. So there we go. We're going to print that as is. We'll end up with a big border on the left side and a big border on the right side tough luck 
that's what I, I, I am shooting for. Let's go ahead and, and recheck our settings. Matt, presentation Matt. I got the blue check mark. That means I'm good to go. And we will go ahead and print. Okay. And I'm just hoping that it grabs it without any problems. Let's go ahead and make sure. Once it goes, uh, once it finishes queuing the image, it will go ding dong. We'll know. Notice I'm not freezing anymore. Um, we'll move that out of the way. This is a similar paper, but it's actually thinner. You can see that cast right there. I got to play around with that. There we go. Now we're going to go ahead and print. Make sure that that actually begins to peak properly. I'm pressing down just slightly. I think I don't, I don't think I printed here for a couple of days. So now think about this. Had I had I gone and converted that to black and white, in other words, made a direct black and white print using black and white mode without first converting that to black and white and then adjusting the tonalities, I may end up with some, you know, just some blah looking grays, especially this area here, you know, the area here where the candle is. So something like this you would convert it to black and white in photoshop or lightroom and then adjust the tones whatever was yellow can be lightened or darkened on uh, oranges such as this area here contains yellow and magenta so you can adjust that uh, just as well and that way when you then get your black and white ready to print it will have the very wide tone range and it would just basically be a lot better than just simply converting to black and white by just using black and white mode in other words the auto conversion it just looks horrible it's not going to really work that's what happened here but this was originally almost no color at all we want to see some we want to see some deep blacks on this paper okay Ah, uh, wouldn't you know it, huh? The last time I printed on presentation mat, guess what I printed with? Black and white mode. So it remembers that. Humish does not see that. Let's see what we got. Regardless, it's gorgeous anyway. Let's print another one. I don't have a lot of this paper, but let's go ahead and print another one and then uh, see what we get. So... I hope you got it. I hope I got another one here. Here we go. I think I only have one more sheet of this. Yeah. Cotton rag. So actually we can then compare. I didn't mean to do that. Printable side on this side. Curl the edges. I did not get any marks that I can see. Okay, so that would be the lazy way to print black and white from a color image. Just use black and white mode and let us do it. Let it do its thing. You don't want to do that. Don't do what I do, what I just did. I got to go into the driver and I got to change that to color. So let's go to properties and see Black and white mode. I knew it. It remembered the last time I printed on, on presentation mat, on premium mat, I should say, I printed in black and white mode. Now it's applying that profile. You saw the change um, popping up. Maybe you did, maybe you didn't. I think you, I think it showed it. But anyway, uh, so now it's set. I still got a nice blue tick mark. So I'm ready to go. And you notice how quickly that printed. It's really interesting how fast that was. Black and white. It prints a lot faster. And also um, the matte paper. Glossy would take a lot longer. We're almost done here, folks. 
Don't forget next week, two o'clock, not one o'clock, two o'clock. I'm going to be building a little model airplane with my buddy. Then I'll get home and I should be able to start the uh, live stream. If, um, if it ends up that I'm home earlier, I may schedule it to a little bit earlier. But just, just hang around and, and be aware that I'm going to be coming on, okay, between 1 and 2, let's just say. I'm looking at my gray ink. How are we doing over here? I'm going to be topping those off this week. Everything has to be topped off. This should be a really, really good close match, I hope. I'll, I'll, I'll show you both views. I am really surprised we did not get any marks. Look. And look at those tones. Man. That is really... This is amazing because normally there's no way in God's green earth you're going to get a deep black like that with this kind of printer. On, on a paper such as this. And I wish you could feel it. I wish you could touch it. It's just has, this is art. This is for art. This is not for just snapshots. Yeah. Really, really good paper. Beautiful paper. Oh yeah. We're getting good colors here. Here we go. Let's see if I can aim it the same direction. Again, this isn't with, without a without a uh, ICC profile. We got a very close match. Density wise, color wise, I could create a profile if I wish to. If I had if I had more of that paper, that is, I really don't. All of these packs were sent to me by a a person many years ago just for me to test so that I really do appreciate that. But look at that. So that, that's really a good result. I'm very, very happy with that. Here we go. Let's put that side by side with the black and white. Again, it's up to you which one you prefer. But again, wow, this paper is really sumptuous. It's really... There are just some things about some papers that just kind of like, wow, compared to something flimsy like uh, that, that, that luster flimsy paper that I had uh, every day, so-called everyday inkjet printing paper. No, not even close. All right. Beautiful. I love it. And crazy texture, I tell you. Hmm. really something anyway i'm glad that worked out let's put that over here in the finished pile so here we have let's see what else we got available here we can sneak in one more now that we are set in color mode finally gold model silk so we did i think we did oh i know that might be this yeah, this is a gold model silk. It has a little bit of a cast. Let's try something. You still have to use matte paper choice. This has less of a texture than the other one did. Let's see if I have something with some really, really crazy strong colors. Let's check to see which is a printable side, this side. They look so similar that they will fool you every single time. So let me go ahead and choose something good here. It has to be suitable for that type of paper because otherwise it's just, you know. By the way, I just realized something. Wow, I never realized. I, I never saw that before. The shot of the this 
It's not black and white. <laughs> it's RGB. It's got a tone to it. So that's where that tone came from. Oh. You could be fooled every time. Let's see what we got here. Oh, wow. This is going to be a good one right here. I don't know what kind of resolution this is. Uh, let's see what we got here. This may or may not work, but I want to try this one right here, folks. And we're going to go ahead and load it without cropping. And here we go. Boom. Okay, so that's going to have a, a score. So what I want to do is I'm going to click on it. Let me see. Does that need any sharpening? I'm going to do that anyway because I want it to be sharpened. But we're printing on a very semi-rough black um, matte paper. There we go. So it sharpens the heck out of it, and it does not produce any kind of artifacts. Okay, done, and okay. That's it. We're wasting some paper, but I don't want to crop this in any way, shape, or form. I want it to have every bit of that, that vertical look to it. And um, this is obviously in Europe somewhere. Print. Again, we're not changing anything, keeping the same settings. Make sure I'm in black and white mode. No, I don't want to be in black and white mode. I want to be in color mode, and it is. Okay, let's commit. Okay. Once it loads, that might be something good to have large sheets print things that are a little bit more textured looking. This looks like it was, I mean, manipulated quite a bit. I'm not sure whose image that was. I found that on the internet on a free image site. Everybody asks me about, where do you get your images? Well, some of them I shoot and some of them I get for free. And so as long as I'm not selling them or anything like that, I guess technically I'm yeah, making a few pennies here from those, but they shouldn't put them on a free site to begin with. They just want people to look at their images. But that one was quite um, pop processed quite a bit. It's really nothing special. It's a, um, I think it's a um, P52 kit it's just one of those snap together kits this person is highly uh handicapped but he's enamored with uh world war ii and world war one planes so he makes drawings for me and gives them to me every week when i see him and uh, we we bring him lunch and uh, uh he's got other people to take care of him but he he is our buddy so i took him to the um, big air show at andrews um, at the uh, Joint Base Andrews here in uh, the D.C. area in Maryland. And uh, he had a blast. Took him to the Air and Space Museum, the big one at Dulles. Again, we took the drawing pad with us, and he sat and drew. So that's what we're making. It's just a little snap-together kit. Uh, we can't, excuse me, we cannot do anything too intricate uh, with him, but uh, he'll love it. And I'm making him another photo album with uh, airplane pictures so he's got he's got the mind of a uh maybe a teenage um boy you know except he's 77. wow i really do like the way this came out Wow. I would like to do something like that and put it on a piece of masonite that I custom cut. 
and blacken the edges and hang it up. That would be fabulous. Again, on paper such as this. Any other paper would just really not do it justice. Glossy, definitely not. Not about to do this on glossy. Uh-uh. It has to be something like that. I wish I had a large sheet of that other paper, uh, the uh, more um, highly textured paper. This is fantastic. I have some um, of the Canson watercolor paper, uh, 18 by 24, so I would have to trim it down to 13 by 24 if I can size it to that, that dimension. Whatever dimensions I can size it to. And then go ahead and uh, attach it to a piece of masonite, custom cut, blacken the edges, and then you're you're good to go. You float it, you mount on your wall so that it's floating an inch away from the wall, and it looks fantastic. Wow! And I would keep that score around it too. That's something I used to do in the past. I don't do that anymore, but I often open up pictures and yeah, they got that score on them. All right, let's see what else we got here. Fever stock photo just got the P900 Belfast Northern Ing Ireland filled up with third party inks, waiting for a couple more prints before the inks come through, but printing well at the moment. So you got the um, over there, you can you can fill your 900s with a uh, um, using uh, refillable cartridges and uh, so-called um, third-party inks. What about resetting? How is that performed over there? How do you do that with those cartridges? This is like the like the original um, refillable cartridges for Epson printers where you just wait till they declare empty and then you remove them and pop them back in and they reset to full. Is that how the chip works? Uh, we don't have that luxury here. So we're not able to use a P900 with uh, any kind of other inks besides OEM, besides originals. Thank you. Yeah, it, it looks really nice. I, I really do like that paper. Um, so anyway, I got so many. I got a pile. Take a look. Got this many. So... We're going to slowly go through those again. I'm trying to trip that printer. It's not, it refuses to go down. So, okay. So what you do is you took the chips off the originals, added to the third party cards and used the chip resetter and used, oh, it's, oh, okay. Okay. Hold on. Wrong one. I think I got what you're talking about. I got this, but it doesn't work here. It doesn't work with our um, US based firmware. I also have the um, resetter for the. Where did I put that at? It should be back here. I have the resetter also for the um, maintenance cartridge, but that may work in U.S. units, but not the the uh, cartridge chip resetter. You do realize that you can actually re refill your originals. It just requires a bit of an operation, and it's a little bit difficult to do. But once if you do it correctly you can actually refill your original cartridges so you don't have to remove the chips and put them in, in third-party type. I have one P900 cartridge here that it's empty. The only difference between P800, because they're exactly the same size, is the internal bag and the position of the chip is angular but what you do is you carefully there are four little tabs right there you see that on the the cap that holds the poppet valve in place and the o-ring in place 
you carefully untab those, remove this pack, this little tab or, or cap, remove the uh, O-ring, then remove the poppet valve, remove the spring, and then you go with a needle, a blunt needle, very carefully, and you have, uh, you hold it in this orientation, and you have what would be, say, 11 o'clock, 2 o'clock, 5 o'clock, 7 o'clock. You enter one of those little openings, and there's a cap that fits underneath inside the bag. You just pry it open slightly. Just knock. You press down carefully. It's scary. It's a scary process. You press down carefully, and you will see a giveaway. Don't go further than that. There's a little flapper valve that now is loose, and it will no longer seal you against injecting ink literally into the in internal bag. So right now, you cannot refill these cartridges. Um, you can draw ink out, but you cannot push ink in until you disable that little that little flapper valve. But again, it's a blind, totally blind process. Um, I have a video series that covers the whole shebang, various ways of uh, accomplishing this. Um, and one of them is relatively safe, and then one of them is a little bit more chancy. And um, I don't, you know, if you have the ability to use third-party cartridges, I don't recommend you going that route anyway, so. Maru, yep, of course. All righty, so I guess that's going to be it. Let me go ahead and close Q image. We'll go ahead and put it on the system tray because I am going to be continuing on with my um, so-called um, perch or unclog tool uh, printings. That happens at 10 o'clock tonight. My Pro 1 and my, my Pro 1000 go through that. My Pro 10, I do that manually occasionally, and that's not so much of a problem. Um, and my Pro 100, of course, is disabled at this point. I got two new ones in box, so I, I'm kind of teetering on bringing one out of the box and setting it up. But who knows? Fever Stock Photo says the printer somehow knows it's third party. But you just click proceed unless you go on. Okay, so yeah, yeah. Um, I could reset these as well. I have a resetter for these, but it just sees it immediately as a as a non-genuine, but it allows you to continue printing. You just have to accept the fact that you might be printing with a non-genuine cartridge. And that's the way it is. Let me see what else we got here. We're at the three-hour mark. We just went over a little bit. If you guys have anything else to discuss, just let me know. Pop it in there. And uh, otherwise, then we will see you next week. We'll go ahead and uh, load my little slideshow in case you missed it. Take a good look at it. Those are all uh, images that I have gotten from the Internet. So, again, and stuff that I use to print, it just helps me out uh, getting my... Uh, printers all set up and being able to output correctly. Uh, I don't have a lot of control images. I just use those as controls. Seems to work quite well. So we'll, we'll see you the next week. Don't forget, it'll be 2 o'clock. Okay, 2 o'clock. And so, and then the following Sunday, we're going to be off the air. No, no live stream. I'll have a video for you guys to watch. It'll be a lengthy video, but it'll be something that you'll be able to catch. If you are if you are um, kind of used to Sundays uh, at one-ish uh, o'clock, uh, then I will have something ready for you guys because we're going to be all day with the family. That day is Christmas Day. All right. Thank you so much. We will see you next week. Bye-bye, everybody. I'll put the...